you getting yourself ready for our show? Everybody, here we are. It's another Jigs and Bigs podcast for you. A recording this week. Uh, it's our it's our first week back with our jig heads. It's been we, Sean and I were talking about this. It's been about three to four weeks since we've had our jig heads back, and we'll explain what's been been going on. But we're back with our jig heads, so they can in, engage with us and and sort of interact with the show as it's happening. We've got a lot of great stuff to talk about. We're going to talk about uh, pre fishing. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it otherwise? We're going to find out from the man himself. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple of things uh in my fishing adventures that happened something major happened over the last seven days that we got to talk about there plus i got something accomplished on my uh checklist of to-do items for the summer finally and uh, i got a big thank you to uh, a close friend of the show for that uh we're gonna talk uh, obviously about you know continuing to pre-fishing we're gonna talk about tournaments how it affects all that stuff we've got some great uh info for you for just the tip this week stay tuned we're gonna go with that pre-fishing theme so there's a, gonna be a lot of like strategy in Involved here, uh, and then we have uh, an, uh, a fuck that guy for this week that comes from one of our very own jig heads, um, and it's it's an interesting one. This is something you have not heard before. I have to stress that you have not a hundred percent heard this before. Uh, of course, we've got you know your tournament updates and all that other good stuff going for you. Stuff you're not going to want to miss, guys. It is Sunday night. We're recording this. It's Sunday night live. Uh, you're hearing this on Tuesday. Get yourself something to uh, enjoy the show with, and we'll see you guys in just a bit. Don't Don't go too far. Oh, man. And the comments start rolling in nice and early. We got uh, Damien at Stretching Lines jumping in. Says, evening Chico Circus. We got Gravy Fishing in the house. Says, what up? Delirious is with us. First time caller, long time listener. I like that. I can appreciate that. We've got uh, Gravy jumping on as well, laughing about that. Swamp Rat Fishing is in the house. Says, dude, Bobby looks tan as shit. Yeah, no, no, no. Bobby is burnt as shit. (laughs) That's what happened to Bobby this week. But, you know, it's, I can't help it. You know, I was born with it. You know, the, the Sicilian blood that runs through these veins. It's like I got, there's like, what is it? Something like 8.75% olive oil is what's flowing through my veins. It's, it's, you know, it's a good place to be. And, uh, it, well, Sean knows how to use, uh, <laughs> Sean knows how to use sunblock. So that's why he looks like a ghost and, and I look like a, a sizzling piece of bacon. Uh, <laughs> just kind of churning and burning in the pan. Oh, my goodness sean how are you buddy i'm great man what's going on it's it's been a week it, it really has been a week this whole summer has been a week if you know what i mean it just feels like it's flying by it's definitely much better than the covid decade well i i you know i gotta be honest with you dude i have seen there have been uh content creators coming out fishing content creators that are already talking fall stuff and i'm just like wait a minute no not yet <laughs> the water can't cool down yet no you know i feel like there's so much that i still need to try to get squeezed in but it's just this summer's been absolutely bananas oy vey then you catching up with weddings from the COVID decade. A lot of that, too. A lot of that, too. I mean, I had two new uh, leads that had come through from my last wedding. It was I left that wedding and they had they're already in my inbox with email uh, requests for those dates. And both of them that came in were about a week away from each other for next year. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be not a complaint. You know, I mean, I'm definitely in in a in a, a lucky position. But, man, I'll tell you, it has just been absolutely insane. Um, totally forgot where I was going to go with this. I had uh, a couple of things that I wanted to note, but we're going to cover pre-fishing. Is it good or bad? That's sort of like the hot topic here. Um, I, I'll weigh in as much as I can. This is, you know, obviously people think pre-fishing and the, the, the mind automatically goes to tournaments, you know, and, 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 you know, pre-fishing a tournament to kind of get ahead, uh, and, and get an advantage, get a read of the water and the conditions as close as you can to actual tournament day. Sean, what are you thinking about, about all this? Well, this was fresh in my mind when we got going uh, earlier today, because 
I had two events this weekend. I pre-fished for both of them. Yep. I had completely different pre-fishing experiences than I did both tournament days. And like, I just wanted to talk about it because I don't know. I don't know. Like is myself and I, I, my other competitor today, mm-hmm. we were both questioning, was it worth it to pre-fish? You know, like, yeah, bigger bodies of water for like national events, like KBF events. Yeah, you almost have to because you're searching for some sort of productive spot. But with a smaller body of water, water, <clears throat> you just you got to go out there and and just like play it, play it by ear. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you know what I did. So this past week, mm-hmm. I prefished twice. I prefished um, Lake Lashaway. Did I do that first? No, I prefished Noise Pond for the Massachusetts Kayak Bassing Western Division. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, this what, what do we call it? the fifty seven run? So Route fifty seven going up in the mountains has a bunch of lakes, ponds, et cetera on it. We hit those, which is generally a favorite of mine. I kind of opened up my playbook to everybody because the Connecticut River was nothing short of swollen from all the rain, so we couldn't we couldn't safely go out on the Connecticut River. Did we didn't we mention this last show? I we think mentioned we did, right? it last show. It was yeah. it, it was the river's just been crazy yeah. treacherous to the point where I'm able to go and catch smallies in the Hoyo Canal because the water levels are high enough or anything that wants to get in is getting in. I thought you were going to say, I can catch smallies in my front yard now. I'm a mile and a half away from the river, but I could can do be. that. It could be. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did that. Uh, we made that switch and I went out and pre-fished there. And, th- and honestly, like this is the worst thing to happen in my opinion. When you get to a tournament or go out, go out pre-fishing for a tournament yep. and you hit a big fish, a big fish that would have meant something in the tournament. It's happened like four or five times in my life and it it never I can think of once where it turned out well, where the next, you know, the, the actual event, I caught some fish of that size or close. I went to, I went up there, I, I hit it, I hit one big fish and it was great. And then come Saturday, conditions had changed. The fish weren't where they were before. And I, it ended, I ended up sticking with what I thought I knew way too long. Yeah. So was the pre-fishing valuable? I don't know. I finished 10th out of 15. And uh, I will say this, this is not a lame excuse. you you and I know we had a discussion about what oh, yeah. things happened around in my life that made me fucking lose with a smile on my face all day. It was great. I'm not going to get into what, sure. why, or how, but I'm a pretty happy individual. You're a happy dude, week. yeah. Yeah, I and um, so. honestly, when it when it came to that event, I just smiled and, I don't know, what do you want to say? Took a beating, got dragged <laughs> behind the woodshed by Nelson and, uh, and Steve Hedges and a few other folks, Jerry Howes. They all took turns on me. It was great. Didn't care. Still don't. But it was still a bright, shiny day in your in your week. Yeah, yeah. And now, as far as the pre fishing went, I didn't throw mm-hmm. everything out the window. I still fished the way I fished, regardless of emotional state. Um, but I, I think the pre fishing affected me where I stuck on one particular area far too long. Yeah, the fish that were biting were elsewhere, and I eventually found them. But I ran out of time. You know, I I. You know, it was a tight matchup. It was really, really like top to bottom, very tight. I think nobody broke 80 inches, which was good, you know, for the competition, not good for the competitors. And, um, you know, I stuck with it. I was in the pack just at the bottom end of it. Yeah. What are you going to do? And um, you, you know, it's like, that's the thing, especially like with a Roadrunner event, like you were running with, with multiple pawns. Like, first off, I think congratulations for pulling that off. Like that was amazing because you'd mentioned it. We had we had kind of mentioned it during the show, but I I don't think the uh, sense of urgency of putting this uh, tournament together for this past Saturday really has the spotlight shine uh, on it long enough. Um, as we were recording that segment for the trifecta reception at the tail end of the trifecta tournament, I, I was setting up recording stuff. We're putting the show together, and you were like even on the drive down, like feverishly putting details together, getting down you know uh, the size. Uh, of of each pond and, and figuring out a formula on on how many anglers you were going to place and working all this out and you pulled it off. I mean, it's like it's really amazing. And I remember having a conversation with you probably about a year ago, and you're like, you know, someday I would just like to be able to do an event like this where it's these individual spots. Do you think that could happen? And realistically, like you put that together in 24 hours. That was Bless. awesome. Great job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. I'm I'm saying 24 hours. There was maybe some sleep in there at one point or another, but like. You freaking nailed it, dude. It was it was awesome, man. It was really good. Yeah. So we got we got it going. And like yep. I said, uh, you know, Steve Hedges fished one pond by himself. 
Home run. Great job, Steve. He had a nice solid bag. He didn't have any monsters. He had a nice solid bag. Yeah. Second place was Nelson. Nelson fished upon with one other person and Nelson hit, um, hit the lunker for the day. It was a 20 and a quarter, which I told him I was going to DQ. Nice job, Nelson. Which I called him a piece of shit for and told him I was going to DQ from the Jigs and Bigs tournament because it just cost me a point. So f- thanks, Nelson. You're a dick. And, uh, <laughs> and then, um, who finished third? I already forgot. It wasn't Jerry House. It was uh, Jerry. I think Jerry finished fourth. I already forgot I because I had some other stuff go on, but I, we're getting off the topic of pre-fishing. Yeah. Um, anyways, my next day, uh, Derek from Three Bells actually came up uh, to Massachusetts. He was visiting. Uh, he wanted to visit Old Glory, you know. Mm-hmm. Actually, you know, Joe and Meg had come down from Old Glory to go see Three Bells last week, and now it was his turn to come up, so... Derek met me at a lake. I said, look, I'm pre-fishing. Come on out with me. Have a good time. We'll see what's going on. And then um, it was just a bad pre-fishing day. And yeah, it's, again, like kind of like vice versa, where I had a bad pre-fishing day. And then I went out today, and the fishing at least was, for me, from 5 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning was solid. It was action. Yep. And then my bite died, but thankfully I held enough of a lead at that point. It was my one-on-one um third round of my knockout matchup i held that lead and the bite died and my competitor was uh was mike morcone who i fished against a couple times mike's a great guy and he just he just wasn't able to catch up and i'm very lucky because he's a extremely talented angler to say the least um when i say national level i mean that because when when there's national and regional tournaments he shows up and he's a stick so it was nice seeing mike again today and um he and i continuing the pre-fishing conversation I, I told him, I said, dude, I pre-fished and I think I caught one 16 incher and I don't know, shit, a 14 incher or something. I don't know. I, I said it was horrible. I said, Derek and I were out for hours. I, uh, Derek got swiped at by one bass. Uh, he caught a bass before I got there and got yep. another hit and that was it. And Mike said, that's funny. He goes, when I was here, the water was up another like foot to foot and a half. The water had drained really, really well from Lake Lashaway. And he goes, I caught two 18 inchers on a tree. A submerged tree. Wow. Because I went back to that tree. It was completely exposed. The, the fish weren't there. No shit. Yeah, he said it was It was a tree in shallow water leading to deep. And because of that one foot of difference, yeah. the tree was exposed and there was no suitable habitat for fish. So he's like, yeah. yeah he, goes, I ended up, he said, I ended up beating the bank all day and that's not my game, but I had to do something. So, I mean, his pre-fishing went well. The tournament for him today, the one-on-one did not, and vice versa for me. Yeah. I, my pre-fishing sucked, and I just – I was at least consistent in one spot for three hours, and that saved my ass. I mean, even even the the last hour, hour and a half, he put up all his fish during that time, and I was, like, sweating bullets because yep. I was watching the scoreboard because I couldn't catch shit. You know, all my bite died at 8 o'clock. I was done at 8 o'clock, and I had to sit and wait and watch. I mean, I was still throwing lures around, but oh, of course, nothing was hitting. So, um, damn. Yeah. So, I mean, pre-fishing is such a, a fickle thing. Like you, you need to do it to see what the environment is, but you take that risk of catching a fish that you're not going to see. And we've talked about it before that, that Candlewood event uh, in Connecticut. Yep. How many people reported huge bass on beds, huge bass on beds, 90 inch, 90 inch bag on the Thursday, 90 inch bag on the Friday. And then all of a sudden, their, their whole plan went to shit because they were bed fishing and that tournament came in Friday night and smoked every bass off every bed. And, you know, what is it worth? I, I don't know. I mean, it's just a question we can leave open-ended. I, I'm, I'm going to continue to do it. But <laughs> Scuba Steve's got a lot to say I, I, about I'm fish laughing. beats and doesn't eat. I'm laughing because these comments are coming in, a lot of them. Uh, and, and Scuba Steve jumps in. He says, uh, oh, oh, what was it? Uh, oh, he says, good job, <laughs> you best slaughtering SOB. And then follows up with another comment here talking about the, the uh, infamous uh, exploits of your bass pizzas. Um you know, we should just mention that uh, that you're coming hot off of the uh, heels of an appearance on um, Turkmenistan's number one fishing podcast, and that is Bass and Brews. So, I mean, you know, the buzz 
has been really great, Sean. Your your uh, your time on on Bass and Brews is really good, and I know part of the hot topic of you being on there was talking about uh, you know eating 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 largemouth specifically. Well, it was actually specifically me and Paul berating Alex, Alex for not eating that's largemouth. True. That's very because true. Paul Paul is a man of class and dignity. He uses his left and right turn indicators <laughs> regularly. He does. <laughs> and uh oh. eat some bass. I ain't got no problem with that. I'm me, me and Paul, we see eye to eye, and then we got that filthy swamp rat that just he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. It's okay. You know, and I'm not gonna hold it against him. He doesn't have to get it, you know. I think maybe Sean should open a pizzeria. I don't know. I should. I should. But I did have a great time on that show. If anybody hasn't yeah. seen it, take a peek at it and start following these guys. Paul and Alex have a great chemistry together. Yep. They're a fucking blast to deal with, especially when you can get you tag team on one to yell at the other. So it went back oh, and great. forth from from me and Paul yelling, you should eat bass. It's fine. And then me and Alex yelling, you need subtitles, you redneck. It was great. <laughs> My favorite was, so I listened back to the interview that I had with Paul on our show from last week's episode, and man, it was so, there was some really good stuff in there. I know, like, that was a long interview, and I just left it as is, you know, because I, th I felt like it was really that good, and I went back and I listened to it, and I was like, man, that is really good, and you're right. I mean, I think the two of them are really good chemistry together. I think this, you know, it's, it's an awesome show, so great job, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me on, yeah. and uh, everybody check them out if you're listening. It's uh, it's bass and bass and brews swamp rat fishing. Check it out. It's on it's on the YouTube's. Yep. The it's on say. YouTube. It's on Spotify, and I believe it's also on Apple Podcasts too. Uh, so make sure to check it out and look for it. Nelson hey. chimes in and says, "Bass pizza, bass pizza, bass pizza." Delicious. Nelson knows. Nelson was there at the inception of the bass pizza when he said, "No, no, no." more garlic <laughs> and things went downhill from there i think i um, think he's on to something though yeah i made a reference on swamp rat fishing that i don't think those guys got but yep. i had to explain it to them being from new england and growing up in the 80s and you know listening everybody everybody tuned into uh everybody tuned into the celtics games on yep. on sports radio you know they were on <laughs> cbs and the sundays and uh the Celtics had an announcer back in the 80s, and he passed on. Obviously, he was an older guy then named Johnny Most. And Johnny Most used to fucking chain smoke. And his voice was like this. He'd be like, bird to McHale, McHale to DJ, DJ back to bird, three-pointer. And he was just matter of fact about it. But there was one, I believe, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm not going to get chewed out on this, but I believe this was the play when when uh, Lambeer, like, clothesline, Bill Lambeer clothesline bird and brought him to the floor. And Johnny Most is losing his fucking mind over this, screaming, this is a disgusting display. It was fantastic. <laughs> so uh, there's been some Johnny Most references. So I actually did refer to Alex as a chain-smoking, half-assed Johnny Most, which Paul laughed at and didn't even know who Johnny Most was. But I, there was just such disgust oh, in my voice. Oh, I figured he got it. Oh, wow. No, they didn't get it. They just laughed because it was funny. <laughs> That's awesome. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. Scuba that's Steve. Awesome. Scuba Steve knows. He knows it's Johnny Most. Oh, dude, that's Mikhail. Mikhail. Mikhail's averaging thirty-two this year. Thirty-two points a game. Um, four assists. Fifteen rebounds. He's an all-star. You're gonna have to do one of these tournament updates in segment two at some random episode as Johnny Most. I think that's only. It's perfect. Bobby Rose Beef, multimedia master. He's got eyes all around his head. You can't get nothing past the guy. <laughs> Anybody see my cowboy killers? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Johnny got, fucking most. We got Fisherman uh, Poppy T87 jumps in and says, uh, suck feet and clap cheeks. You're damn right, sir. You're damn we right, should make sir. note at this point because of the volume and uh, uncouthness of the comments that you did, in fact, send an invite to the entire hook set. Oh, of course. Fred this evening. Yeah, I wanted this to be a little off the rails, so I knew who you're going to call. <laughs> hook set hoodlums. <laughs> That's what yeah. you're going to do. I wore my nice new hook set hoodlum shirt for the occasion. I they're all of them right now. All of those hook yeah. set hoodlums are somehow great at typing out these disgusting comments while painting with their own feces on a wall. It's fantastic. They're like the Gigi Allen of the. Uh, <laughs> freshwater fishing set, if you will, you know? Hook said hoodlums paint with their own shit on the walls. Nobody paints with shit like the hoodlums. <laughs> I freaking love it, man. 
<laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Delirious says I was going to say Ghostbusters. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, uh, getting back to pre-fishing, I do want to throw this out there that I think that, that uh, for a lot of people, pre-fishing is more like just a... Um, I don't even want to say a, a confidence builder necessarily, but more of like uh, a comfort thing. Like, well, let me go and see this body of water before I have this pressure of tournament day. You know, let's go and see whatever it is. Although it, it can work against you. I mean, you know, you see people that put just giants on the board while they're pre-fishing and they're just like, well, that one's probably not going to bite tomorrow or the next day, you know, when I'm looking for it. So who knows? You know, it's like you really it's one of those things you have to figure out. Is it worth, you know, putting yourself in a situation where maybe you're setting yourself up with like a bad strategy? If something changes, there's a, there's a switch off in the weather. Something happens that throws your plan to shit. Or is it, you know, again, like at least you've been out on the water and you can say like, all right, this isn't my first time here. I'm not coming in absolutely green to it. But yep, the tough know. thing is like we have all of these resources available as tournament anglers. We have Google Maps. Yep. We have we have I mean, in our state, we have the pond maps from the DCR yep. provided for most of them, not all of them, but th there's a good amount. Many of them. Yeah. Yeah. And these things are not going to tell you the temperature of the water. They're not going to tell you what the weeds look like. Mm -hmm. They're not going to tell you aquatic growth. They're not going to tell you some certain kinds of structure stumps. They may, they may not. So you really should get out there that it's just the risk and reward is, um, yeah, the risk and reward is if you, if, if you, you know, something changes or if you catch a big fish, and it doesn't count for the tournament. That hurts. It hurts so much. That is the worst. Yep. Yep. So. Yeah, I, I like Nelson jumps in and says, I think people pre-fish incorrectly. He says, the fishing is hardly ever the same two days in a row. I definitely get that. And even uh, OG Scuba Steve jumps in and says, shit, the guy I fished, uh, who I fished with this week predicted uh, he swore he caught three pounders all day and we had a dink fest. I blame it on the moon phase. And and that's the thing. There are so many variables when yeah. you're talking about fishing just in general, like that recipe for success, there's so many different things that can come into play. And if there's one of those things that you overlook that you're not taking into consideration, something changes, it, it can screw your strategy. So, I mean, and, and this, again, I think speaks to what, you know, we've heard before, like when we talk about competing in fishing is about experience and it's drawing on your experience. So how do you handle these situations? I mean, uh, really, I think the the smartest way to pre-fish would be to say, you know, uh, so if, if this doesn't happen, great, I found them over here, but where, where, where could they possibly go if they're not here tomorrow? You know, if they're not yeah. here, you know, uh, when it's tournament time, where, where are the other high percentage spots? And, and I mean, I've heard it said before that fishing is, is essentially a numbers game where you're basically the more times your line is in the water, the more success you're likely to have. And, you know, and you, you want to be throwing that bait in the spots that are the highest percentage possible and then whittle down from there. There might be something you're overlooking and they're, you know, relating to one specific brush pile for whatever random reason that comes up, you know, who knows? Says the the man who hasn't hasn't tournament fished a day in his life gets two thumbs up from from Nelson yeah. who just crushed the lunker in this week's I, Western Division tournament. That's awesome. I'm going to moderately disagree based on my records and my yep. fishing experiences yeah, yeah. with Steve Steve and the Moon Phase because full moon and new moon are generally the two best times when you're going to catch fish, big fish. But I am going to completely 100 percent back endorse and agree with Steve. Pre-fish, not pre-dick. Not pre-dick. Like yeah, I like That's that good. a lot. That's really good. That's uh, good. I, I fully expect the comments to... Uh Degenerate? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. We have uh, Lockwood Fishing joining us. Cody, welcome, welcome, Cody. He's uh, he's now 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 Cody's in the room, so who knows where this could necessarily go? It's gonna go to ripping ports. I'll tell you that. It is definitely gonna go to ripping ports. You know, we should mention this too. We have something amazing coming up. Like we're joking about the uh, Hooks at Hoodlums Pro Staff and everything, but coming up in early August, we have something really cool that's going on really cool and it's uh and it's sort of it, it it started out as an old glory tournament and it's sort of turned into this big um 
family reunion, sort of, as well as like a multi-angle type uh, event that's going to go on. So there's an invitational tournament that's happening in Central Mass coming up very soon. And uh, it's it's a lot of our competitors that are in there are from Old Glory Outdoors. They're Hookset Hoodlums Pro staff members. Um, Sean the Fisherman will be competing. I am not competing because we're running a, kind of a little side challenge. Uh, and I, I have no issues with this challenge whatsoever. But somebody needs to prepare the prize should we call it a prize i don't know if it's a prize it's a surprise it, it is definitely a surprise yeah. yeah it might be a shock um so this is we're talking about along with this this tournament the boats and scrotes challenge will be happening as well so mm-hmm. uh, that's why if you've seen on my facebook page i've been uh asking around a lot of people uh for their input on um where i could best procure uh about eight pounds or so of bull testicles for rocky mountain oysters oh delirious is letting a little scra- uh, strategy going that he's a uh, sinking kayaks he's got his uh, drill ready to go you said i'm competing and i'm directing i think i'm going to be actually babysitting and performing safety duty right. because yeah. this is going to be a shit show of epic proportions that i mean i mean let's think of it this way fucking the the uh the staff at isla nublar maryland in crumpton <laughs> they're shipping cody up in one of those velociraptor cases cages with the t- you know the tasers and yep. his canoe there's going to be some shit. Yeah, there is going to be some shit. This is going to be interesting. I think oh, it's yeah. going to be a whole lot of fun. And, and we're doing. There's a meet and greet happening afterwards at uh, at Old Glory Outdoors. So you know, come on by and you can meet some of these uh, upstanding individuals, if you will. <laughs> you know, it'll be it'll be a whole lot of fun. We're gonna have a great time. We're having. A, or I think we're gonna have a, a really great time. You can meet some of these wild, savage animals in their natural environment. Yep. Please bring sedatives and tasers. And we might even have some extra Rocky Mountain oysters if you uh, care to indulge. We got a spare nut. They're really down. good. They're really good with the bomb hot sauce. This will also be in tow. Yeah. It's going to be good. A blue flashing light as a babysitter. <laughs> Sean needs a blue flashing light as a babysitter. Maybe a helmet with a light and a siren. Uh, you know what I'm going to need as an adult? This is it's out of fucking control. <laughs> OG Scoop and Steve says he's signing autographs, five bucks a pop, and Cody will stamp it with his sack. <laughs> My God. Oh, you love See what I mean? sauce. See? Mm-hmm. See what I mean? <laughs> I just I just want to go out, catch some fish, and eat a testicle, and we've just got Steve and Cody are gonna be This is what happened. Raring to go. Yep. This is this is what happened. So let's talk um about well, let's let's go over. I'll go through my week. Um, my week, really not a whole lot of, uh, of, of crazy stuff going on. Um, I had what I thought was a short week, but I accomplished something really great. Um, two things actually. So I had gotten on the board with a large mouth, uh, on the, on the large mouth, uh, leaderboard, um, with a 13 and a quarter, 12 and a quarter after the penalty. Um, <laughs> And uh, this is while I was in Rhode Island, finally on the board. I'm like, okay, this is great. So I, I knew this week it was all about multi-species, all about going out and getting other species. I knew I could track down largemouth, and I knew that there was one spot nearby that I that has produced uh, larger than what I've got on the board, largemouth, with regularity. So... The issue is with this water, as high as it is, um, it, there's always a lot of weeds here. This is a great spot to go and fish for frog, fish with frogs. Um, you know, it, it's it's awesome. So I had gone out there with my frog and rod and a variety of different frogs to throw, some buzz toads, just to see what what I could get to bite. And nothing was biting top water. Nothing at all was not happening. So I cut off the frog and I tied on a uh, a punching rig. I used a, a three quarter ounce uh, tungsten weight. With a flipping hook and a plastic of my choice, and uh, we we pitched this into into the mats and let it drop. And I, I probably honestly I could have gotten away with using the full ounce if I had any. It was just the biggest the biggest weight that I had. So have to kind of work it to get it to drop back into the, the down into the depths. And I managed to actually connect with uh, a, a largemouth, which was kind of nice. This was actually my first. Uh, largemouth bass fishing this style of fishing. 
uh, which which I, I definitely definitely enjoyed. That was really really great. Uh, unfortunately, it was ex- it was a cookie cutter of exactly what I entered on the board. So my thought was that I'm going to upgrade it all because what I was looking for was at least a 19, 19 and a half. I think uh, nineteen to twenty inch fish is really what I needed before I was going to re- call out that fish on the large more mouth board. Instead, I entered this in the any five, so it at least gets me a point there. Step in the right direction. Now the plan was that uh, Sean and I were going to fish a couple days later. Later, over at uh, a pond that is uh, has is chock full of, of of multi-species, great great variety of fish in this pond. And we got there, and our dreams were shattered because the uh, the brook that run- feeds this pond basically flooded out the entire road, so they closed the road, which sucked. So we had uh, gone to another body of water, and uh, Sean, you remember where when when we were at that body of water, and I said, "Hey, I think I know those dudes, the Berkshire Bassin guys." Yes. That was them. I followed up with them. They said it was a great day to be out there. I was like, yeah. I was like, we just thought it was a little crowded over there. So we decided to head back. So so we went back to uh, a a Sean the Fisherman um, historical honey hole, I would say. I mean, he's he's had really great days there. And and, and this. I've had some really bad days there, too. It's a feast or famine location. That's true. That's that's very (laughs) true. Um, The thing is. All right. So I should I should probably break it down like this. So. We get over to this pond and we launch. This is my first time over there. And uh, it was, you know, I had a good feeling. I had a great feeling, actually, about fishing this one body of water. And uh, we go over there and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working. I'm a buzz toad on uh, lots, of, lots of weeds, lots of mats all over the place. And uh, I'm throwing a buzz toad around all over. And I'm, I'm not really getting anything, but I can see them hitting up on the surface. So what do I do? That's why I made the decision. What I was going to do was was throw the uh, the fluke that had been doing so well for me uh, the past few weeks. Actually, actually, yeah, I think this has probably been one of the highest performing baits that I've thrown within you know the last month or so. So I throw this uh, this fluke around, and I'm, I'm getting bites. I'm getting bites, but they're not really committing to it. And then I finally hooked one, uh, a nibbler. Um, what were we talking about? Like maybe, I think it was, it, it came in about a 10, 10, 10 and a quarter, I think was, was what it was. Uh, flopped off the board before I could get the picture snapped and, uh, release him. Uh, so he's not doing anything good for me, but I did outfish on the fisherman that day. Congrats, sir. Feeling. Bravo. Yeah, it Bravo. was, it was a, a good feeling. I like to I say, a, I got skunked. I like to say it's it's very much like uh, the old saying that uh, the sun even shines on a dog's ass some days. That's kind of like how 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 it is. But uh, very good. It was a good day though. It was fun. We had a good time. It's all that matters. Yeah. Right? No, I had a blast, man. I yeah. mean, honestly, we got out. We drove around. We did we eat or drink? We ate or drank everything. I think, I think as we usual. Did. That's what we do. Yeah. And uh, no, hey, we went to that pond. <clears throat> that place, like I said, it's feast or famine. You know, uh, the biggest thing was, and we we saw or we heard Nelson describe it in the, um, I believe in the interview last year when when yep. we talked with him, it was another one of those days where just every nibbler bass in the lake was jumping sky high after dragonflies, and I had made a comment to you like, dude, this is where the, what was it, the uh, the lunker hunt dragonfly would have played a, a you know it would a possible role, but definitely, you know, those are. Uh, those are a little tough to predict. It ends. Uh, uh, we're getting a question here on the tournament, uh, Dylan. Yep. It ends on the the end of the month, so and the last month. day of the month at uh, eleven fifty nine p.m. Yeah, there's what thirty one in July, right? Yep. Basically, that is Saturday. That's the thirty first. Is it really? Yep. Holy shit! It I, is. I don't know what Saturday. fucking day it is. Yeah, whatever. You know, it's been a long. It's been a long weekend, bro. <laughs> dude, if it ends that late, I'm, I'm doing a wedding in Central Mass. If uh, anybody out there wants to do some night fishing, I might. No, nah, I have a wedding to do the next morning. I, I'm not gonna be able to do that. Huh? Fuck. <laughs> Lockwood Fishing says, "Bass and Brews is a fluke." <laughs> Well, everyone who's listening, um, I'd like you to enjoy the audio version of the Hookset Hoodlums uh, uh, Pro Staff thread this evening, sponsored by Jigs and Bigs. <laughs> it's okay, you know. Yeah, it's good. It's good. We uh, we 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 you know we put together the best show we possibly can. Berkshire Brett's with us. Berkshire Brett, we got your uh, submission for the FTG. That's going to be coming up in another episode very soon. 
Thank you, Brett. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate that. We have actually the FTG segment's really good. Uh, we we yeah. got some good stuff coming for that. You guys have not been holding back at all, and we like that. Some of these are actually really, really just unbelievable creative stories. So we'll definitely get into all of that stuff. Um, something else happened this week after that that whole showdown at uh, uh, Western Mass Pond. I had. Um, well, I got this this week to finally check off something that I've been meaning to get done for a while. I haven't had the time or the right tools for the job in order to put it together, and that was getting my my kayak trailer together. So I uh, I went to the expert. I, I went to the expert, and actually, as as, as were to were to play out, it was uh, not this past Saturday Saturday, but a week ago when I was on my way to uh, Rhode Island when we stopped at um, Old Glory, and who do we bump into? Delirious Angler. And Delirious, we bump in, you know, I bump into him, we're talking, he's like, hey, buddy, when are you going to come down and do your trailer? And I realized I had this spot on my calendar that worked out ideal and uh, checked against his calendar to make sure it would work. And uh, yeah, it happened. So now the, uh, the, the trailer is fully assembled. I put the Ascend on there. I actually took it for a spin today with the Ascend on it to see if it did ride any smoother than without because it's super light, man. It's like taking it on the highway. I mean, it's super light. Eight-inch wheels. It's wicked low to the ground. But uh, it, it does pretty good. It does all right. And uh, it, it's, it's all right. So I'm definitely psyched about it. Some modifications that still need to happen. We're going to put a ladder rack on there. It'll give me an upper level. That way I'll be able to put a kayak on the lower level and the upper level. Got some plans going, but we're going to keep it pretty simple for the most part. And uh, it was it was good, man. Yeah, oh, 100% D, it was. It was fate running in, in, into you that day. It was 100%. And let me tell you, so Delirious is uh, a very skilled uh, and has a lot of know-how, but he has the right tools for the job. I would have been doing this with hand tools myself, and I would probably still be working on it. It was it was not fun. Or you'd be an amputee. Yeah, the metal was very <laughs> sharp. Uh, all the edges on that uh, on the frame for that trailer were very, very sharp. So much that in the kit, it came with like some safety gl- uh, gloves so to, so to prevent oh. cuts. Yeah, I mean, it was it, it was no joke. But yeah, I mean, hey, works like a charm. I'm psyched. You know, we're going to modify some stuff. I got a bunch of stickers. I want to get uh, placed in some strategic spots. Just want to make sure that I'm not going to be, you know, putting like a, a sweet sticker in somewhere. And then, you know, the ladder rack's going to like drill into it or something like that and get all all janky. But I'm psyched. Cool. <laughs> we're, there were a bunch of parts left over, actually, Lockwood. Now that you mention it, there were many parts left over. But that's because there's a couple of, of things that we did not uh, put together, like uh, the... What do you call them? The um, basically, if I wanted to put wooden rails around the sides, I left all that stuff off to keep it as streamlined as possible. Um, everything that uh, and and it's solid, man. It is really, really solid. It was an adventure <laughs> on the ride home. I'm like, this thing is so light behind me, and you know, I'm on the highway doing 65, and I'm like, son of a bitch, popping wheelies. <laughs> yeah, popping wheelies. Exactly. Sideboards. Yep. Awesome. The uh, the remainder of my week, the, the filling in the blank. So <clears throat> obviously I pre-fished twice. We had the two tournaments, you know, Saturday with MAKB West and then the uh, the MAKB knockout on Sunday. Yep. Well, actually today, a few hours ago. So I do have, uh, for the MAKB West tournament, Steve Hedges did win that. Nelson was second. And Jerry House was third. Let me make oh, sure I'm good third. on that. Yeah, Jerry was third. Nice. We went to... I went to lunch with uh, Mike Williams and Jerry uh, Jerry Howes afterwards. Good time, great guys. Just uh, because everyone was all split up, I, I've been trying to get everyone together afterwards to do a lunch if it's at a a location that can provide that. But yeah. this one, every, everyone was going in every different direction. Some people went straight to Interstate 90 to get home, and I was like, all right. Well, Mike was with me, and Jerry actually stopped by afterwards at the lake we were at because it was on his way home. So yeah. I said, "You want to join us?" He said, "Sure," and we. We we classed it up and went to ninety nine, which was nice. And then, classed uh, it up. Yep, had burgers and got out of there. Um, today, yeah, there were two there were two notes I didn't tell you about. I, I wanted your reaction on this. This is a near miss on a fuck that guy story. Okay, near miss. I mean, I, I'm talking the, the fuse almost went off. It just it fizzled out right before the bomb. You know what I mean? Okay. At I had mentioned that between five and eight, 
maybe six and eight, I think, when I got to this one area that I was fishing that was productive. Mm -hmm. I think it was the only productive area on the lake all day with any consistency. It's roadside, and it's on a main road. And there's some big, massive rocks, and there is a – I mean, there was a spillway I was fishing around. Mm -hmm. I just pulled my first or second 16-incher off the spillway, and a gentleman comes down maybe two feet from where I caught the fish and sets up and – Pulls out a big giant five gallon white bucket. Oh man. He's got his minnows. He's got his bobber. He's got what yep. appears to be a, a deep sea rod that he bought from Ocean State Job Lot. And he winged that son of a bitch right out in between me and the spot I was fishing. And I looked at him and I said, Dude, I'm fishing a tournament. Can you help me out and move? He did not understand English and oh. he waved at me. And that's when it went from fuck that guy to all right. I'm just going to deal with it. I'm not, he's not going to understand me swearing at him anyways, as I'm not going to waste my time. And that guy watched me, he was using shiners and I was using lures. And that guy watched me rip in over half a dozen bass in about 10 minutes. That's awesome though. (laughs) And release every one. Yeah. Which I think probably pissed him off more because we in Massachusetts have what's known as the white bucket brigade. And I can't even say that every time I say the brigade, the brigade, see what I did? The brigade. Yeah. The white bucket brigade. Yeah. They're out there, and they bring a five-gallon white pail with them every time they fish. They don't care if it's a fish. They don't care if it's a snake, a turtle. If they find a mouse, it goes into that bucket, and they're eating it. Laws don't matter. They don't care sizes. Believe it or not, they I, I'm convinced that they think they can get meat off a six-inch pickerel. Yep. There's no meat on a pickerel. There's definitely not on a six-inch one. Yeah, they do it. So, um, yeah. I I took great pride in releasing all those bass. And no, Scuba Steve, I did not eat a single one of them. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. So because of the language barrier, because he was obviously out there just doing his thing and had no idea what the etiquette was, he's been given the reprieve on the fuck that guy. Yep. Yep. Now. Now. This time. Now, yeah. Yeah, this time. This time. He learns English. Fuck that guy. Yep. When we got back to the launch... Myself and Mr. Mark Morcone. We got back and there was a car in the parking lot. He goes, you know this guy? And I'm like, I don't know. who. I don't know. It's a random car. How the fuck do I know this guy? Yeah. He goes, he's got a Jigs and Big sticker on his car. Who and was I said, it? I said, really? <laughs> and I looked at it and I'm like, I don't recognize a car. Who comes walking around the corner? Bobcat Howie Alexi yes. Dabari himself. Yes. <laughs> he goes, I... He goes, I thought I heard your voice. And he, we, were, we were talking for a while. So it was nice to see Chris today. He didn't recognize my truck. I didn't recognize his car. It was just so funny. We shared a parking lot. And Mike Morcone is asking me if I know him. And I'm like, no, I thought I'm a fucking random guy. I have no idea. That's awesome. Speaking of that same response, I should let this story out because I promised to tell it at some point or another. And Joe from Old Glory is going to laugh, cry, and then laugh again. So uh, there was some... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they do. Uh, there was a uh, a phone call made from from Old Glory to Three Bells um, regarding uh, one of, I believe it was Zach, uh, Joe's new general manager over at Old Glory, mm-hmm. was looking for a kayak. And obviously through us or through whoever, he was directed to call the people who provide kayaks, Three Bells. Well, Zach called up and got uh, the the... I believe his name is Chris, their the new hire down at Old Glory who's helping yep. out, whether it's for the summer or permanently. I have no idea what Chris's uh, employment terms are, but he's there. He's working the front desk. He's answering the phones. He's doing whatever needs to be done. And he approached Derek and said, hey, I've got Zach on the phone. And Derek looks at him blankly and he says, Zach, he says he's calling uh, from Joe Brown. And, you know, Joe Brown is a relatively common name. And Derek just simply responds That's without right. thinking, who the fuck is Joe Brown? <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. <laughs> poor, poor Joe. <laughs> so poor nice. Joe. Good <laughs> just trying to just trying to spread the love and get people kayaks. What do you, you know, just. Who the fuck is he? <laughs> I, I do have to say, like, Joe has seen the light when it comes yeah. to kayak fishing. Yeah. Like, he he really has. Like, he's so gung-ho about it now. And, you know, like, I mean, every every time now he's – it's just – it's pictures of, like, him and all these crazy bodies. And he's he's another one. He's like, 
I got some spots I got to bring you guys to. He's like, this is going to be absolutely fantastic, like just a blast. You're damn right, OG Scuba Steve. Old Glory is amazing. Hands down, it's 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 my favorite place to be on Earth, really. I'd rather go to Old Glory and just walk around with a cup of coffee and just BS with people than go to a bar. <laughs> like, I really, I genuinely would. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Speaking, speaking of Old Glory, did I tell you who was working there today? No. Who was working there today? Our, our man, Scott. Scott? Yep. Really? Scott, of, yeah. So Scott was there, and I said, hi, Scott. And I we had a little bit of a tournament snafu with Scott, yep. and I apologized oh, to him right. over the snafu. And then I made him apologize to me because when I called him initially about the tournament snafu, he didn't tell me I was on speakerphone. And I said something I really should not have said. Oh, no. And his mom was in the room. That's right. (laughs) And I got yelled at by Scott's mom. (laughs) We need to tell people when they're on speakerphone, Scott. Definitely. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, because that that can be dangerous. (laughs) <laughs> Joe sent me a picture of Quaybog Pond, and it was completely flooded in the parking lot. And this was after that incident. And I said, I have a solution to that. Send Scott over there with a fucking mop. <laughs> That'll teach him. It'll teach him not to tell people they're on speakerphone. He may still be there mopping. I have no idea. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Yeah. Anything's possible these days. Yeah. Fine. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm spent. <laughs> <laughs> it's only the segment one is complete. I am. I've want to go to bed fuck this we did we did all right we did all right right. guys we will be back with more after this still so much more of the show uh to to come for you great stuff in fact we our interview this week is so good we've got uh well we have a rep from torquedo uh we're talking about the little stuff the little stuff and you'll find out jeff little is with us we're going to talk about all kinds of great stuff um he has an amazing youtube channel very very interesting and, and highly highly informative he's a uh, a very very wise individual in the art of uh really any kind of paddle sports at all really uh whether it's kayaks or canoes uh white water rafting you na- you name it he's got a lot of information about this and uh he's got he's a good resource uh just a heads up in that interview Jeff had very limited internet while we were recording this, so there are some, you know, dropouts. So if something sounds a little bit uh, like it doesn't line up, it's not cohesive necessarily, sit tight. We've left it as complete as we can and cut out only the stuff that was really, really bad. Good stuff. Anyway, what what do you you got, Sean? I was going to say, surprise, surprise. Jeff was transmitting from Maryland. We've seen how the internet connections go from Maryland. We haven't we, Cody? Yeah, we have. We definitely, definitely have. Um, what I do want to throw out there, though, is that after this break, we'll be back with our Just the Tip segment and FTG. Uh, but we, before we get to that, we do have a, uh, a a good message from our excellent friends, our good friends, our family over at Old Glory Outdoors. Jigs and Bigs is proud to announce we're being supported by Old Glory Outdoors. They're a veteran-owned company that carries fishing and hunting gear. Plus, they're highly active in supporting veteran organizations and charities. Old Glory is an authorized dealer of favorite rods, FX rods, Guggen baits, X-Zone lures, Sixth Sense, and many more. There's a brick-and-mortar store located in East Brookfield, Massachusetts, but you can also order online at oldgloryoutdoors.com. They ship anywhere in the lower 48 states or order Order online and pick up at the store. When you order, use the promo code Jigs and Bigs, and you'll save 10% off your complete order. Plus, you'll help support the show. Make sure to check out the apparel line called OGO Gear while you're there. Old Glory Outdoors believes in the slogan "Start 'em Young" to keep kids away from screens and enjoying nature. They've got a full array of live bait too. Check out OldGloryOutdoors.com and use the promo code Jigs and Bigs. Save some money and gear up now. Bobby and Sean now have a special presentation for us all. They'd like to give everyone just the tip. Just the tip, that's all? <laughs> never. It never happens. And, uh, <laughs> we never just give the tip. Nope. Well, so. believe it Believe it or not, I actually have a straightforward tip. I'm going to tell you guys what I do, why I do it. We're going to continue on our theme of pre-fishing. This is so simple. If you got a lure that you like to lose, like to like to lose, nobody likes to lose any fucking lures. If you have a a lure you like to use, 
and you feel that it can be productive at a spot and you're pre-fishing, pre-fish with it. If you catch one fish on it, that's a fish. If you catch two fish on it, that's a pattern. If it's a tournament, keep fishing that lure. If you're pre-fishing, take that lure off immediately and save it for the tournament. I do that because I like catching fish on the tournament and not during pre-fishing, especially 20 inchers that could really go a long way during a tournament and really don't mean shit pre-fishing. Mm. How simple is that? That's all I got for just a tip. That's a pretty good tip. You yeah. catch two fish on a lure, cut the fucking thing off and save it for the tournament. You've determined a pattern. Don't, don't, don't abuse it. Don't push your save luck. Save it. Yeah. How, and, how and shitty that, would the, that be if you were like, oh, yeah, this lipless is killing it. Oh, this is awesome. I'm going to just see if I can catch one more. And then you break off. The, yeah. And, the, <laughs> and then you're like, the, shit. The other day, that that 20 inch hit on the second cast of a lure. Yep. So that was my one fish. And I cut that lure off. I'm like, fuck me. I, I've never been unhappier about a 20 inch fish. I know it's such a, a, a shitty, you know, cause you're like, I, I mean, obviously when you're in multiple tournaments, like you can enter that. I mean, I assume that that, that 20 inch went into the, the jigs and bigs tournament. Yeah. It Plus was another monthly in, possibly. It was sitting in second until some piece of shit. I know fired in a 20.25 and passed me by a quarter an inch, a uh, quarter of an inch in the big five tournament, which I was top 10. Thanks a lot, Nelson. Lunker sure. alert. Yeah. I'm impressed with you, Nelson. Yeah, no, that's a good one. That's the lunker alert right there. Nelson DeCosta goes to Western Massachusetts Ponds. Man catches nothing but hogs. Hogs, I said, hogs. (laughs) Mikhail the Bird, (laughs) three-pointer. I want to throw this. You said lure losses, and and Brett chimes in, and he goes, I'm probably $75 deep this year for lure losses. And then um, OG Scuba Steve says something that I think is – genius he goes brett i can't even count anymore i what i would do is i wouldn't count anymore <laughs> that's what i do you, know, you just be happier if you don't steve couldn't count before oh <laughs> <laughs> holy shit bust my balls about my pizza will you steve uh-huh. fuck you <laughs> I was thinking they were go- only, the only, 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 you know, consequence was like he wouldn't get a slice, but, you know, oh, he's going to get a slice. Oh, yeah. He's going to get a whole filet on that slice. Yep. I hear you. I hear you. Well, you know about what time it is, right? It's our favorite time and everyone we know's favorite time. You're damn right. <laughs> Alrighty, guys, it is time for FTG. Fuck that guy. And this week we have we have a submission from one of our jig heads, uh, one and only Mr. Andy Quinn, and uh, he left us a message on our on our website. Uh, you know, if you go to jigsandbigs.com, you click the orange button that just says leave a voice message, and you can leave a sixty second message, whether we fuck this guy or something else. But let's see what Andy had to say. Hey guys, I've got a story for fuck this guy. Coming off the water, heading over to the ramp. I realize there's a couple boats lined up there trying to get out of the water, trying to get in the water. There's two cars on the ramp and they both have their little personal watercraft behind them. As we get closer, I realize that one of these guys has got his personal watercraft in the water and he's not loading his boat or loading his uh, personal watercraft or unloading it. He's he's washing his car. (laughs) He's just sitting there washing his car. People are standing around waiting. Get a little closer. I give him the international sign for what the fuck are you doing? And he gives me, he looks up, he sees, he looks around, continues to wash his car. Zero fucks given. But uh, eventually he uh, dragged it out of there and uh, we, we got underway. But I, I, I don't know where anybody thinks that it's okay to wash a car at a boat ramp. Yeah, fuck that guy. Fuck that guy so like, hard. It's so it's so absurd. It's comedic. Like I mean, I, and there's so many questions. Like how? What did he have a siphon going, and he was just taking pond water? Like, like my 
my biggest question is when did Berkshire Brett buy jet skis? <laughs> he would never We love own you, Brett. Lace. I'm just kidding. He would never own own a set of lake lice. Never. Nope, never. 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 It would never. He happen. is not a lake louse himself. No, nope. he is not. Oh. I, I I mean, how do we break this down? I mean, what there's so, there, you're right. There's so many questions. There are. There's not a lot of answers. Like I mean, a, in a way, I mean, I've got I've got two answers right off the top of my head. Okay, drugs and or alcohol. See, that's where where my head goes right there. But it's like okay, so so put yourself in that mind mindset right there. You're you're out, you know, to recreate on the water. You've got the appropriate um, tools to make that happen. In this case, you know, some jet skis and stuff. Uh, you know. You're out to enjoy yourself, and then, you know, as you're loading up, right in that moment, you're like, you know what? You know, my ride is not exactly as sparkly as it could be. Something needs to be done. You know, I I don't know. I have seen people go to, like, a car wash and, you know, with, like, maybe a boat or I assume people with kayaks do the same thing. Spray them off, you know? Like, when you get going to, like, a real, like, a shit body of water that's just got a bunch of, like, stuff on it you want to clean off your boat. Yeah, I, I could see that. But, like, I don't know. I mean, I know where he was at. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, boat ramps tend to accumulate floating plants and shit. Like, true. Was he washing his car with a lily pad that floated up? Some hydrilla, perhaps? Little <laughs> Some eel grass. He's like, you, you know what buffs the shit out of a car? Eurasian milfoil. <laughs> it really does. It yeah. really does. You want to talk about building a lather? Your <laughs> Eurasian milfoil will definitely build a good lather. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> fuck that guy. I mean, bottom line, that what a piece of shit. <laughs> That's awful. That's just so bizarre. So, okay. So here's Berkshire Brett, I think, is, is is putting this in here. He goes, so was he getting buckets of water from the lake to wash his car? Did he have a pump, a generator, or a power washer with him? I want to know the mechanics behind this achievement. That's what I'm saying. Brett, to some extent, I I feel like like it was just a, like, I, I feel like this was just, you know, in terms of engineering it all, is amazing. I don't know, Bobby. Why doesn't Brett tell us? <laughs> <laughs> I just laughed so hard I farted. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. I made the man shit his pants. <laughs> From a close-up of my fucking ugly face. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, and 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 then again, the logical question, you know, Lockwood jumps in and says, "I have a great idea. Let me, I have a great idea. Let me was my my car my wait my dirty car with dirty pond water. That's the thing. If he was using pond water, well, that was now that is a pretty pretty clear lake. I mean, it's yeah. a mountain lake, Cody. It's pretty rocky. Smallmouth mm -hmm. live there. Plenty of trout. It's nice and clean." For the most part, unless you count the Eurasian mill foil and the floating plants, and but again, I'm sure some some drunk guy took a poop in there one day. Whatever, it's true. Farts are tricks at our age. <laughs> You're damn right, Lockwood. You're damn yeah. right, Lockwood. Yeah. So fuck that guy. Just fuck that bizarre, guy. bizarre. I don't know. Oh yeah. my goodness. All right. So uh, let's go ahead. There's there's actually one thing I would like to mention uh, before we move on to our uh, our tournament stuff, Sean. If if you could, if you could humor me for a moment. So love to. Recently, we had a listener uh, contact me and ask me about my luscious beard. Um, and say, you know, what is it that you're using for your beard as far as products? And as luck would have it, uh, I recently started working with a company because I love their products. Um, I used to be just one of the guys that would just like wash my beard with whatever I was, you know, using for body wash or shampoo or, you know, I mean, not, not a big shampoo guy. I have minimal hair. Go on. I you, feel would you, you would wash it at the lake? At the lake, sometimes just, yeah. <laughs> I'd just be out in my, my kayak and be like, you know what, guys? I, I can use a little touching up myself and just dump the fucker and go in, and it was awesome. Oh, man, you know? my, my beard needs a, needs a wash. I got to yeah. go straight for the boat ramp. Just take an 18-inch pickerel and give it a good lather, you know? I mean, that's what, <laughs> that's what it's all about. That's how we do things here. But in, in all seriousness, I, I, I like one of the things that I've always heard about good beard health and, and you know, getting, like, results and taking good care of it is beard oil. 
Beard oil is imperative. It's huge. And I've tried a bunch of different products. And the thing is, it's like you get some that are just garbage. Like you you rub them in and they feel like sticky or they leave a residue. Sometimes beard conditioning products will actually stiffen up like gel or mousse. And then they end up cracking and doing more damage than any good. So what I came across was this company called Live Bearded. And Live Bearded makes 100% natural products. And they have several different scents. But the thing is, is like this beard oil, it absorbs so easily into your beard and skin. And like no itching. This is the softest my beard has ever been. The most manageable. I also started, uh, well, what I what I started using was a couple of products. Instead of just using the whatever soap my wife was buying <laughs> for that, I, I, I have a bottle of beard wash and uh, and beard conditioner. This is like the foundation to set up everything. And then the last thing, the one thing that drives me nuts about having a beard are flyaways, especially in the humidity. And this product that they have, their beard butter is dynamite. Um, if you guys are interested in checking, if you have a beard or you have someone in your life who has a beard that maybe you think needs to take a little bit of better care of it, go over to livebearded.com and uh, you can save yourself some cash with the promo code roastbeef. Save yourself some cash with that promo code. Go ahead, check it out. It's stuff that I, I started using just before I went to Vegas, and I brought it with me in that uh, the desert heat there, and it was it was great. It was it was absolutely fantastic. I've, I've been getting lots of compliments on my beard, which is great. I love it. So I just wanted to share that just for what it was worth. Now I'm sure I'm going to look, and there's going to be a bunch of ridiculous comments well, on are, here like oh, this. Yeah. Yep, like OG Scuba C. <laughs> Yep, they're uh, and then, and they're, they're in there. Lockwood, coconut oil, good for beards and anal. And you're not wrong. You're not <laughs> wrong. Um, but the problem is, is the uh, the scent isn't as as pleasant. Um, well, at that, if, you know what? If Cody's up for for trying different things, <laughs> he's up for for those for those purposes. Cody, we want you to grab a couple of pickerel and tell us <laughs> tell us how that works out. <laughs> mean i don't know <laughs> i just don't know it just felt right <laughs> it just felt right <laughs> that's the that's the beards and anal sound effect that's what that's for <laughs> lockwood fish it grabs the pickerel he's doing anal <laughs> <laughs> oh jesus christ <laughs> this crying, be known dude. as the is this going to be known as the 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 Hookstead Hoodlum Invasion episode or the Johnny Most episode? Because Johnny Most is everywhere tonight. He's got a lot to say. He really is, man. He really is all over the place, and he should be. <laughs> it's gonna, Cody's going to start a band called <laughs> Anal Pickerel. Pickerel. <laughs> <laughs> the terrific. first hit single will be Good Lather. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. my God. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Yeah, we're bad human beings. <laughs> we we truly are. We yeah. truly are, Sean. So I think it's about uh, that time. We wanna, you want to break down some tournament stuff? I got your music. I want my, where's my music? Oh, I got your music for you there, Mama. We're in the middle of the Jigs and Bigs tournament for July. I can't do it. My throat hurts. Now. I know. I hear you. <laughs> Gave it your best. I did. <coughs> I'm dying. Fucking dying. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm ready. Johnny Most is done for the night. I think Johnny Most. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and, and I'm going to be talking like Johnny Most unintentionally because of what I've just done to my throat this evening. Go ahead, hoodlums. Have some fun with that fucking comment. Okay. Here we are. Week three is wrapped. We are in the uh, week. We're in the middle of what extended week four, I guess you could call it. This is a long month. Yeah, we got three extra days in the end of the month. Well, whatever. It's extended week four. I don't want to call it half-ass week five because why? This is extended week four. We're yeah. we're, we're we're rolling. There has been some uh, some turnover up top. Okay. <clears throat> we have uh, we have myself. I added uh, another point to my lead which was awesome. I'm very proud of myself. I'm patting myself on the back right now. Yep. Then, big surprise, but I know how hard this man is working at getting out at every given opportunity to get a fish on the board. 
Second place by one point. Howie, Dabari. I, I, Chris, great job, dude. Yeah, he's killing ass. it, man. I'm so blown away with the way Chris is just like, he's a contender. Yeah, dude, he's 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 kicking ass. He's kicking ass. So I have 25 points. I'm in first. Chris Dabari is in second with 19. Big surprise, Jerry House, third place, 18. Trout Master. And then uh, after that, we got a couple more people with d- double digits. We've got Rich Soderquist. He's got 16. And Jay Manning, also known as J.Manning on Instagram. Uh, he's got 12. He's got a dozen points. And um, we got another week of this. And, mm-hmm. and we have seen some species we have not seen before. Number of channel cats have been put in. We've got, uh, I mean, this is on me, all the pike. There's no, There has not been a tournament with this many pikes submitted. We got a walleye in there. And there was something else I saw. Bowfin. Oh, ri- there, there's been a bowfin submitted, and Rich Sodaquist has been submitting a lot of freshwater drum. Mm. So we've, we've seen a lot of shit this tournament. It's exciting. Um, I hit the first to 100. I hit the first to 200. And I'm hanging out in first place. Should I should I let them peek behind the beef curtains on what we've decided for Go how for I affect things? Yeah. You think that's okay? I think that's fair. Yeah. So Bobby and I are obviously running this tournament. I'm, I'm the right hand of Bobby. I run the tournament for him. And the tournament's for you guys. <clears throat> but yep. we're not giving stuff away. And I fish a lot. So I don't really need or want to collect prizes meant for you guys. So what we're going to do is the, f- the first to 100, that prize has been eliminated. As in, I'm not getting it. But the funds are still there. Mm-hmm. Same for the first to 200. And should I manage to stick around in first, second, or third place, those funds will still be available. They will be consolidated for the remaining prizes. So everybody who's getting a prize out of this, whether it be second, first, third, whatever, um, if someone manages to top 300 and the beat shot at largemouth, those prizes just got better. So basically, I'm playing spoiler. That's pretty awesome. Think of it that way. Yeah, think about it like that, guys. But we're not giving prizes away, so I can say, ha ha, I got into first, second, or third. Now we're going to pass one prize along down to fourth. That's not fair. No. You got you to earn that shit. First, second, and third. If I take first, second, or third, prizes get better for we'll everybody just else. beef them up. Beef them beef up. We'll beef them. Yes. <clears throat> so we have, uh, what, five days left of this tournament. Get out there and fish, folks. It's still close. And there's, you know, I mentioned those names, but there's, man, one, two, three, four. Four people lurking around at more than seven points, skulking around, perhaps. They're there. Keep it up. That's pretty awesome, guys. Been been an awesome tournament so far. And uh the only thing I could say about it, the only complaint I have, and it's it's not I'm not complaining. I mean, is it a complaint? It is a complaint, isn't it? Because I gotta judge all these things. I'm complaining. Fuck it. Get those mouths closed. You guys are boning yourselves out of points. That's all I can say. It's true. Rules rules are rules. I'm sticking by them. Those mouths are open. You're getting tagged. That's it. Done deal. Bobby Rose Beef got tagged this week. Oh, yeah? We we, we do this. Got tagged hard. Power roll. Not Close fun. Close them out. Not fun. And the only other tournament note I have for any sort of tournament is it's a week away from August. Yeah. Chronic Trips. Chronic Trips starts up. We are actually going to have that up for pre-reg. But actually, by the time this airs, it should be up for pre-registration. Go ahead and jump in on that, especially if you're a saltwater angler. That comes into play. Same format, points, multi-species. Get out in the salt, play in the salt, have some fun in the salt. It's good shit. And freshwater counts as well. So that's all I got on the tournament front, my man. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm fingers crossed I should be picking up the new kayak very soon. Um and that will most likely happen while the August Chronic Trips is going on. I might launch that uh, new kayak and break it in on some salt, uh, just around three bells. Bobby Rose beefs in the ocean. Great White's got his leg. Game over. <laughs> it could happen. It could. It could one hundred percent happen. <laughs> it's a baby wheel. 
Oh my god. Oh, I you know what? I I forgot about this man. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. So Todd Grubb uh posted a video on his Fishing with Grubb's YouTube channel. And um it made me think of the conversation we had last week regarding saltwater, fog, and the like. Um the party boat that he works on almost got hit by another boat. Um Holy shit. yeah, and and he happened to be it had the camera at just the right location, and you could actually see this coming, like cutting right through the fro- the right through the fog and they're blaring horns and stuff like that, crazy and everybody who's on the boat is like, you know, I think they're fishing for fluke. Everybody who's on the boat was just like losing their minds. They're just like, shut what fuck you guys. <laughs> like it was just like crazy. <laughs> and this is a good size boat. I was like, so again, I was like, wow. So that 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 captain of that boat, fuck that guy. I'm yeah, I'm adding him. He's he's getting the the uh amendum right there. Yeah. And yeah. They, we were in the fog last weekend for the three. Yeah. Trifecta. And that's what was, reminded me. I was like, oh my God. And that's like a good size boat that they're on. I'm like, could you imagine if you were just on a kayak and you're just like, son of a bitch? You know? Yep. Nelson and, and Sarah and I got the fuck off the water when that yep. shit rolled in thick. It was like, all right, we're good. Yeah. You don't want to get hit by a boat. Yep. So understandable. Yeah. No, no, no. Good stuff, but it was a, it was a good video. I recommend you guys checking that out. Yeah, they weren't using the radar, Nelson, or looking exactly. Fuck those guys, especially if you have it. Why would you not look at it? <laughs> they might have been doing a little pickerel anal on the Maybe side. Maybe they to were pay attention to the radar. You know, I I they sure were, Sean. They now, sure were. Uh, you know, because I have all sorts of OCD and I can't pay attention to shit. You know, for the past few months when we've been recording, yep. I'm going to let everybody know, I don't look at the comments because it's just too distracting for yeah. me and I want to answer. Yep. However, I do see a comment that I have to ask about. Fire away. Scuba Steve says regarding pickerel or anal pickerel, they have asshole teeth. <laughs> <laughs> what are asshole teeth? Are they we're sharp? Gonna, we're going to need some, some uh, definition here, Steve, if you could. Uh, Steve, what are asshole teeth? <laughs> like, are they they're they're toothy? And some people would say that that chain pickerel are assholes of the freshwater species, fr- freshwater variety. But what have we what have we created here? <laughs> are they to, do they have teeth in their assholes? Are, are they assholes with teeth? Are they swimming as? Are they assholes with fins and teeth? What what, the, what is happening? I don't know. <laughs> I'm at a loss. I am at a loss. Oh, my God. Oh, he just says, hey, man, they're toothy fish. Cody's got to be careful. Yeah, that's true. That's true. (laughs) Cody or his victim or partner in the act or whatever it is. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. Is it time for another break? It is. It is time for another break, guys. We're going to be back with our interview with Jeff Little. Definitely, you're going to. You, this is some some great stuff. He shares some really really good stories and some good information. Uh, you'll enjoy it. Uh, and also, we've got uh, you know a couple other things we want to cover as well in the outro. Um, we'll be right back though after this from our extremely good friends and fam over at Three Bells Outfitters. Jigs and Bigs is proud to announce that we're being supported by Three Bells Outfitters. Located in Smith Cove on the Niantic River, TBO is Connecticut's premier paddle sports retailer. They're a full service shop specializing in kayaks and paddle boards for everything from recreation to tournament fishing. Three Bells is an authorized dealer of Hobie, Jackson, Feel Free, Native, and Bonafide kayaks, as well as many paddle board brands. Not sure of what kind of SUP or kayak you want? TBO offers free demos of all brands. Want to go for an extended test drive? They have a full service rental facility on site. Three Bells also offers a complete rigging service for your kayak with such brands as Yak Attack, Yak Gear, Burly Pro, Yak Power, Torquedo, and more. The sky is the limit. You can visit Three Bells Outfitters in person or online at threebellsoutfitters.com. They ship anywhere in the lower 48 states or order online and pick up at the store. Can't make it to the store to pick up your kayak or worry the freight company might might damage your purchase? Three Bells Outfitters offers a white glove delivery of kayaks within a 225 mile radius of their store at a rate less than typical freight carriers. They will deliver your kayak, set it up, and answer any questions you may have. Be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to tell them Jigs and Bigs sent you Three Bells Outfitters because life is better on the water.
Hey, what's up, guys? Jigs and Bigs here with a little interview segment for you. We have a good one. Uh, this week, we're joined with Jeff Little, who Sean and I both had the opportunity to connect with through the Trifecta Tournament. Um, Jeff is a representative of Torquedo. He also has a very interesting YouTube channel that uh, I'd love for him to kind of tell us a little bit more about. Jeff, how you doing? Welcome. Doing good, man. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Very good. I have Sean with me now. Sean, Sean spent a little more time uh, down at the trifecta tournament, uh, both on the water and you know, kind of helping with some of the administration stuff, uh, with uh, you know, helping out Lauren and Derek for you know, handing out the uh, with the captains meeting, all kinds of stuff like that. We've got. Uh, I'm going to defer a lot to Sean to start things off because uh, he and you had definitely talked much more, but uh, I definitely at some point want to get you to tell us uh, some of the stories some some of the information about your youtube channel because there's some really great information over there yep Sean? i um i actually started producing video i think back in 2009 and oh okay cool i i did that as a means to um to continue teaching kayak fishing i have i'm actually a american canoe association certified paddling instructor and i was a kayak fishing guide for about 10 years and i I kind of burned out after 10 years of doing it one on one yep. and wanted to keep teaching it and video was was a way to reach a lot more people. So that's yeah. uh that's how the the videography started and how most of the the content that's on the little stuff mm -hmm. YouTube channel uh how that kicked off. That's awesome. It's just it's so interesting because that type of content, a lot like podcasting, when you start creating this library, you know, it, it could exist there for a long period of time. It's starting in 2009. It, it definitely has. But have you seen that you've, you've had new viewers start catching some things that maybe are eight, 10 years old, and now they're getting this information and, and it's so it's still useful to the viewer? It is the, the, um, the, Paddling instruction mm -hmm. content kind of seems dry uh, if you if you know if you don't really dig into it, and that's a lot of what I what I try to steer people towards is the the river safety, paddling safety, um, just just to keep people you know keep keep people from being in trouble yep. on the river or out in big open water. Um, I'm actually getting ready to do some more of that with um, a kayak fishing guide up on Lake Erie. His name is Chuck Earls, very good walleye angler. Mm -hmm. um, and, and walleye fishing on one of the great lakes is, is just as daunting as heading out like we did this weekend into the Long Island Sound where you deal with fog, you deal with boat traffic, you deal with the potential of, you know, weather coming in and you, you need to know how to handle yourself to to be safe for a lot of different things, and that, that's some of what I'll be filming with mm -hmm. with Chuck Earls. And uh, you know, we'll we'll be going probably three, four, five, six, seven miles offshore on Lake Erie to find uh, to find the walleye. And uh, holy cow! Yeah, we'll we'll cover some distance. Yeah. I did it last summer with them with the um, with pedal drives. Yep, and we did. I think we did 19.2 miles. I actually, I keep track of it on the Angler app on my phone to keep track of distance. And uh, a pedal drive, 19.2 uh, miles at the end of it, I was kind of leaning forward with my hands to give my, my legs a rest doing the the uh, the doggy paddle version of using a pedal drive on a kayak yeah. um, just to give myself a break. <laughs> Makes um, sense. But we've he's a uh, he's now a torpedo convert. I've I've got him using our three horsepower electric outboard, and he is in essence uh, grown his his number of reliable spots, his mm. reefs, his his this you know this contour is always active with uh, you know with walleye at this depth. Um, he's grown his his list of reliable places to go put his clients on fish quite a bit in the two months or so that, um, that he's had the, the motor on there. And, uh, it's cause it's quiet. He's not spooking the fish. Mm -hmm. It's a direct drive motor. That's uh, about the, the pound thrust is about 105 
and you put that on a kayak, you're going six and a half, seven mile an hour yeah. at top speed, but he's trolling uh, at, you know, between 0.9 and like 1.3 miles per hour. So, yeah. Gotcha. But the safety mm. and the, the knowing how to reboard and knowing how to, you know, monitor your weather and, and have, you know, your radio plugged into what's going on so that, you know, okay, we're, um, we're four and a half miles offshore. And if, if that wind changes and our, you know, our foot to foot and a half chop changes to three footers inside of 20 minutes, uh, it's time to, time to start thinking about, you know, yeah. let's, let's start trolling this direction. Then they go to fours and it's like, get out. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. It, it's a, it's a game changer at that, at that point. But but yeah, the one one of uh, safety video I did that was that I think is is critical. Um, kayak fishing is growing so much uh, so quickly. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of people that are that are novice to it. Uh, the one skill that I would make sure that everyone has, besides the ability and and the dedication to always put your life jacket on, but is reboarding. If you oh, yeah. flip out of your boat, um, we, we lose people every year. In, in kayak fishing and it's usually weather bad weather and it knocks them out of the boat and it even happens with the super stable boats like a native titan that's super wide or a, a hobie pro angler 14 which mm-hmm. somebody won i think a pro angler 12 at the three bells outfitters trifecta yeah uh, super stable boat great platform uh, but you can find yourself uh, in the water next to it in the in certain situations sure and the ability to reboard, um, you're not you're not going to be good at it in the worst of situations, the worst conditions. If you haven't tested it, if you haven't practiced in good conditions, yeah. If you haven't gone through the process of knowing, hey, it's open water. I can't springboard off the bottom to launch myself back up on here. You don't know Mm -hmm. the body mechanics to get back in that kayak. Or if you have to flip it, you got to practice that. And uh, the reboarding video was, was one of them that, uh, that I feel, I feel good. I feel like I've saved lives. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's one that's been shared a whole lot and gotten out to, to a lot of people. And uh, it's important. No, definitely. I'm sure there's been many, many a, a uh, an individual that's purchased a brand new kayak, and there are you know a million things going through their mind, and they're like, "How do I do this?" When I got my first kayak, I mean, luckily I have Sean to kind of like provide the the basics of you know what I needed to do to get started. But you're right. I mean, you you get people all the time that are looking for this information, and I can remember specifically how searching for how to climb into a kayak from how to reboard a kayak for fat right. people. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, how am I going to do this? And right. I've, I found some tips that were really useful. You know, it's just, I'm like, that's yeah. Cause you're right. You know, if you can't springboard off the bottom or something like that, you put yourself in a situation where your ability to control what's going on starts to drift quickly, right. you know? Unbelievable, Sean. Why don't you jump in here and uh, and and kind of take the reins? I I actually had a, a nice lead in, and then you know every one of our listeners that likes to bust me about the safety stuff. I didn't know this was coming. <laughs> Thank course. you, Jeff. You are echoing everything I've said. You should have heard us this spring because our monologue. I think half of it throughout April and May consisted of obvious new paddlers with everything that's gone on with the coronavirus in the country and people really ha- flocking to the outdoors. Yeah. How many people did we complain about, Bobby, that we saw in jeans and a T-shirt when I knew the water was no, you know, no hotter than 50 degrees? Oh, it yeah. was it was just endless. So, Jeff, thank you very much. I, I wasn't expecting that. I feel vilified and you are welcome on this show anytime. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> hypothermia is certainly part of it. For sure. Having the wrong clothes is is, uh, you know, that just suck all the heat out of your body. E- even it. I know that I've jumped in. Um, the Susquehanna river, which is really my home water. When I was out with my, my kids and, uh, I got an anchor stuck and we were, we were not in kayaks in that, in that trip, we were in a big white 16 foot whitewater cataract and I got my anchor Mm -hmm. stuck and I tried getting it out a bunch of times. And, you know, I think, I think it was the end of September, early October. 
And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going in after this. Cause I don't want to cut the, the anchor and, yeah. and, uh, you know, and be done for the day. I, we still had five or six hours that we could fish and I, I wanted to, to stay out there, but I also knew, you know, 60, 61 degree water sounds like it's okay. It's really not. Yeah. And I, I stripped down to my, uh, to my underwear and jumped in both my boys. They were, um, they were probably seven and nine at the time. Um, I jumped in and held on. And what happens to your body when, when you, that much skin hits cold water, you have an involuntary hyperventilation. You just start, whether you mean to or not, you really yep. heavily, deeply breathe. And that's usually what gets people is the, the involuntary gasp. And whether your head's above or below the surface of the water, your body's going to draw a deep breath. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just hung out there on the, on the edge of the boat before, you know, I think I took about two or three minutes to regulate my breathing and just chill out and just say, yeah, this sucks, uh, but I'm going to get used to it sucking before I, I decide to um, <clears throat> handline down, you know, 10 feet down to that anchor. And the amazing thing is I got to the anchor and it was the easiest thing to pull out once I got my hands on it. It mm -hmm. came free in a second. But but yeah, you, your, your body... Um, does that involuntary hyperventilation and when, when that, you know, that much cold water hits your skin and uh, it could be 80 degrees, you know, it usually happens. It happens a lot in the spring, 80 mm -hmm. degrees out, beautiful day. And, you know, you see people without the life jacket wearing the wrong clothes uh, in, you know, if they flip into, you know, 50 degree water, the, the hypothermia gets them and what actually happens and i've been hypothermic on land before yep. to to the extent that it was that i believe looking back it was life-threatening um your muscles in your arms and your legs and your hands and your fingers they stop doing what you ask them to do yeah you you um hypothermia you get the umbles you mumble stumble fumble and grumble you mumble, your speech actually gets slurred. Uh, you stumble as you're walking. You're, I remember, you know, when I was hypothermic and it was on a camping trip on a river, it was a week-long float trip down the, the upper Potomac. And we weren't near, you know, we weren't near anywhere that we could really get dry. I mean, the mm. tent leaked and so sleeping bags were soaked and it was the middle of the night. And, you know, <clears throat> I was walking around trying, in a pouring rain, trying to find logs that I could or sticks that I could cut down to the, the uh to dry wood to get some shavings going to, to start a fire. Yeah. And I was tripping over logs and and falling down. So mumble, stumble, fumble. As I'm holding the knife, the knife, you know, I keep I, I really couldn't grasp the knife handle very well. I kept dropping it. And then uh grumble. You just you're grumpy. Um yeah. so in other words you you resemble an angry drunk. You know, pretty much. <laughs> you start yeah. seeing seeing somebody, you know, resemble those, you know, mumble, stumble, fumble, grumble. They're they're getting hypothermic, and um, really, the bottom line of it is that you have to dress properly. And and I'm going to come back to talking about Chuck Earls and his his advocacy of you know all those. He's near Cleveland, uh, trying to get people into the sport and making their season longer. Yep. By by saying, hey, if if you're coming out with me in October or or March, April, even May, um, you need to be in a dry suit like you're not you're not booking a trip with me unless you show that, hey, here's a picture of me in my dry suit. It fits me properly. And, you know, being able to withstand flipping into the water and not, you know, not going hypothermic quick. So, mm. so the right gear is, is for sure important. And, uh, you know, more people we can educate in that, in that vein, the more people we will, we will save. Definitely. Jeff, along, along that line, um, all my research for staying 
you know, really alive and healthy in the, in the cold when I'm fishing. Um, so I'll, I'll continue to go out towards the coast in colder weather. And what I've done is reference my friends that are divers. I have a couple that dive uh, for a couple friends that dive. And what I've gotten out of them is, you know, a certain level of neoprene will help me out. I, I wear neoprene, uh, three or five millimeter, basically a split wetsuit. When I go out underneath my warm clothes, what's your take on that? Is that, Am I in the right direction? Because I've been recommending it to people, and I, I don't know any better. I'm not trained. I'm just so I've, you know, I've I've worn um, wetsuits before, and basically it's it's uh, it, it's going to delay your um, your involuntary gasp. It, you have a little bit longer before that that water hits you hard enough that you're hyperventilating, but mm-hmm. it doesn't delay it much. And, and it may be enough that, yeah, that gives you enough of a delay that if you're practiced at reboarding, yeah, you'll get back on there and, and you'll be okay. Um, but I think at that point, you you know, it soaks, the, the cold water will soak through the neoprene and that's how it works, that it, it, you know, it warms up next to your skin. It requires your body heat to warm up that water that's held in the neoprene next to your skin. And in doing that, you you knock some body temperature down. Um, whereas, you know, I've, to prove a point in, in really educate and film, you know, hey, I'm going to do a full submersion uh, and I'm going to get back to my full day of fishing. Yeah, you get back into, you know, if, if you were going to go out for eight hours and, and you end up in the water. And, and it can happen with something as simple as, hey, we beached for a second to, you know, relieve yourself or, or stop and eat a sandwich or whatever, and you slip and, and you fall apart. That's how most people end up wet. Uh, and you fall part way into the water. Um, if you have a dry suit on, you're you're continuing that eight hour trip. Mm-hmm. If if you're only partially protected from from being soaked to the skin. Um, you know, you're, <laughs> let me put it in fisherman terms. Um, you're not going to fish well the rest of the, that trip, you know, and I know that you have to put it in terms like that so that people get it, that mm. it's, you know, all right, I'll be safe, but you're not going to fish well. Yeah. Um, and if, if, you know, the wind picks up or you have, other adverse things happen as a result of the early stages of hypothermia, you could get into more trouble. So no dry suits, I think, you know, and, and I think a lot of it comes from my, my white water background, um, that that's just what you wear. Um, if you're diving, yeah. Uh, I guess that's part of, you know, part of the attire and, you know, it's, it's a sport that, you are inherently going to be in the water the whole time. Whereas, you know, anything paddle sports related, you're not in the water. So now I would, I would steer more towards the, the dry suits. Perfect. I mean, what, with, with my take on it was direct, the direct question I asked my diving buddies were I go into the water. I would, I would not even consider fishing anymore. Cause most of the time I'm out cold weather fishing, I'm out by myself or with one person and we're just fun fishing. You know what I mean? It's not a tournament situation. Right. So, yeah. So when I talked to them, it was like, I just want to keep myself alive to get back to my car. And they said, yeah, the three or five, you know, depending on the temperature of the water, you should be fine. And usually that for me is above 40 degrees. So 40 yep. or 50. Um, yep. So I guess Bobby, we have to start mm-hmm. looking at uh, dry suits. Well, Hey, you know, let's, yeah, we got to, do we gotta we're, do. we're in the process of looking to uh, create new partnerships and sponsors. So, you know, let's any, test out any some dry, stuff. Any dry suit companies out there that want to, <laughs> you know, really get a workout with your gear and a couple of fat guys, come on, line up. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, Jeff, uh, I, I talked with you a little bit this weekend um, about the, I, I didn't tell you my first impression of you. And you're going to laugh at this. And it wasn't really as much you as it was Jody Queen, because the first time I had bumped into you was um, at the Candlewood KBF event. And I believe the first day you did not launch at the same place as me, but the second day you did. Now, the the second day I saw you, you were with Jody Queen and you were just doing, uh, you were just filming with him, correct? Or were you in the tournament as well? I was not in the tournament. Uh, The the three days of pre-fishing, I fished some, but 
in order to be really effective at, at capturing his story, you know, it, it, any of the, the stories. I, I did a video with Christine Fisher, you know, back in February with her musky fishing. Um, that one, I didn't I didn't bring any rods. I'm like, I, I got to just film with Jody. It was it was a you know, it was a buddy trip where we were both fishing. But then once it was tournament day, uh, I didn't you know, I didn't I didn't fish during tournament day because well because it's rude <laughs> like they're trying to you know compete and i don't want to i don't want to sore lip any fish that are you know that could help them um but anyways yeah i you had, i yeah so joe i think J- J- jody finished what first or second on the sunday correct he finished yeah he got second on yeah. on day two of it yeah well when when we got to the launch on sunday it was myself and a another member of um my uh, Massachusetts kayak bassing Western division that had parked right next to each other. And I remember getting in the water and seeing you and Jody. I think you guys launched either a little late or you fished right around the ramp. I don't know what the story was, but I remember you guys going by me and I'm like, that dude's got a goddamn film crew. What have I gotten myself into? (laughs) Right. (laughs) So that intimidation factor. um, And, and, you know, I wasn't ready for that. I, I didn't, I didn't really get it. I mean, I fished my, my game and I went out and did my thing and, you know, excellent bass tournament where I caught a 25 pound carp, but we're, you know, that's another story. And, uh, but yeah, that was, that was highly intimidating. So when I saw you this weekend and you were at the table right next to us, I was helping out with uh, three bells, getting the captain's bags out for all the competitors. And I saw you sitting there and I introduced myself and I said, Hey, you're at Candlewood. And we started talking a little bit. And within like two minutes, um, you know, Jeff, you, you've got a soft spoken demeanor. And I'm, I would, all I could think of was we've got to talk with, with Jeff on on air and, this is a man who speaks softly and carries a big stick, stick meaning fishing rod. So we're happy to right. have you on. Yep. And, um, you know, honestly, just even like we weren't, I was not planning on bringing up any safety stuff. And we just, we just killed about a half hour on safety stuff. Like, I think we could make this a segment of our show going forward, what Jeff says or something like that. But, yeah, um, you know, idea. you're just a, you're a wealth of information. You've done not maybe not all of it, but man, you've done near all of it. Um, and you know, if you want to start, let's talk about the Susquehanna River. And where I want to start is, I actually have some experience on the Susquehanna. I, uh, being military, I had a uh, a week long trip I yep. had to do that do down there. Um, at um, God, you know what? I'm going to forget the name of the base. Martinsburg in West Virginia. Martinsburg Air Base, Air, yep. Air National Guard Base. So I was I was there for a week, uh, doing some work there. And that was 2012. So it was five or six years after I quit drinking. Now, anytime I went on a tour of duty or anything like that for work, any sort of trip, I started bringing fishing rods. All right. Now, I wish I would have seen the video that I just saw about a half hour ago uh, that you recorded in 2019 with Chad Hoover about how to pack, (laughs) how to pack a travel kit for fishing. But I went down there. Yeah, I went down there with one of my airmen and uh, we did our job and he knew that I was avoiding drinking and going out fishing. So I said, what's the nearest thing? Boom. Susquehanna river, five miles away from that base. We would go every day after work. I brought two, um, two rods that could break down a bait caster for myself and he couldn't use a bait caster. So I bought a spinning rod and we went to Walmart and just got some, I, I honestly, I think there was zoom super flukes or something, just something simple, something white. And we just had a blast with smallmouth. nothing, no trophies, but it was, I mean, you fish that river, you know, there, I'm sure there's sections that will turn up a ton of fish and they're just fun. So we had a great week um, just just nabbing smallmouth waiting in the Susquehanna, you know. Mm-hmm. So you said you said Martinsburg, West Virginia, right? Yes. OK, the closest river there is actually the Shenandoah, Damn it, it's, the Susquehanna. It's a Shenandoah and the, the Susquehanna meets up with it a couple miles down, right? No, nope. the Potomac joins with the with the Shenandoah and Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Beautiful That's, spot. Um, is, see, I, I all I remember is about that so spot. So Susquehanna, the Susquehanna is, um, it's about a mile wide. It's a huge river. And it's it comes in at the top of the Chesapeake Bay. And right there at the top of the bay is the Susquehanna Flats, which is a... I would say used to be a really great place to fish for, for the kind of striper that we were looking for last, um, you know, last weekend. Um, 
But the Susquehanna basically goes right up through the center of the state of Pennsylvania and up into New York. Uh, and mm. the the Shenandoah actually flows south out of, or actually flows in a northerly direction out of central, like west central Virginia up through that little eastern uh, panhandle tip of West Virginia before joining with the Potomac, which goes downstream right past DC. Um, but we, it is good that we're ta- we're going to talk about the Susquehanna River because I know there's a lot of kayak fishing tournaments. I know um, kayak bass fishing has had had some tournaments there. Mm-hmm. Hobie Bass Open Series has one coming up at the end of this this month and. Uh, I think it's the July 29th and August or July 30th and August 1st, whatever. It's right at the end of the month into, into August. Um, and the Susquehanna is, is one of the rivers that I, I guided on for about 10 years. Um, I jumped around. I was fairly nomadic with uh, some on the Monoxy, which is a smaller tributary uh, watershed that I live in. Uh, in Maryland. And then we do the Juniata and the Susquehanna. The Juniata in Susquehanna by far um, the strongest in recent years. You know, we did a, um, I actually did a, a river bassin tournament there in 2015, where I partnered with my buddy Jed and we, um, we set a river bassin um, team total record for that entire series. We had 123.75 inches on six fish. Uh, Holy and I, got a, crap. I got a six pound, wow. 10 ouncer that day, you know, of the tournament. And uh, it, it's, it's not as strong as it was back in 2015, 2016. Mm-hmm. We just had a very strong year class of, of big fish um, that, that had reached maturation. They had reached old age and, there weren't a, you know, it wasn't the kind of fishery where you go out and you have 60, 70, 80 fish days, but yeah, you, you could have days where you get 10 of them over 19 inches. No problem. That's, that's amazing. So, so, so Shenandoah, the, Susquehanna, the both start, is, both start with S and have four syllables. My bad. <laughs> They're in the yeah, same no country. My bad. <laughs> so, it's a mile wide. There's seven mountain ranges that it that it crosses, and every time it crosses one of those those mountains, you have class two th- and class three rapids, and you know it's it's a place where you need some paddling skills for mm-hmm. sure to get through that. You can't just rely on a, a pedal drive yep. uh, to get through there. And the the best primer that I can tell people about, I'll come back to the YouTube channel. Um, if you if you do a search in YouTube for river kayak fishing skills DVD, river kayak fishing skills DVD, okay, uh, you'll find the first DVD I produced, and um, I think it was 2011 is when I produced it when I released it, and that was that was really a um, a video version of the class that I that I taught the American Canoe Ah, American Canoe Association um, class, which was basic river kayak, that I overlay lots of fishing skills on top of the paddling skills. And, you know, it teaches people how to run a rapid, you know, safely, how to scout it, uh, how to, if you if you run into a rock sideways, you know, how to lean into the rock instead of what is uh, instinctual is to lean away from it, which is is how to you know, flip out of your kayak really quick. If you lean away from the rock, mm-hmm. um, it teaches you the basic, you know, components of, of each paddle stroke and how to do a sweep stroke or draw or, or eddy turns and peel outs and ferrying it, just all these concepts of moving a kayak in, in moving water. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a good primer and it's a good, you know, safety primer, but it also goes into pattern development. Yeah. And pattern development, and in, in I think besides the, the river safety, uh, pattern development, the process of developing a pattern has, in, in teaching that to 
you know, 10 years of guide clients over the years and teaching mm -hmm. it on, on video is probably the most useful um, skill set that I could, that I think I've passed on to anybody. Um, pattern development is where you catch a fish and you go to the location where you caught the fish and you make observations about that location. Uh, how deep mm -hmm. was it? How much current was there? When you jam your paddle down into the water, you 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 know you can tell. All right, it's about four feet deep, and and when it hit bottom, did it did the tip of that paddle hit muck or mm. or brush or crunch into gravel, or was it more like sand or was it clay? What was the bottom substrate like? Yeah. Um, how far are you from a current break? Is there a current gradient where right next to it there's screaming fast water and in, in just on the other side of it, it's it's dead calm. Um, you know, was there a presence of what cover was there? Was there you know was there grass in that area? Was was it shaded or or bright and and sunny? So you make all these observations yeah. once you catch a fish about that location. Then you go back to what you did that that fish decided to eat. All right, you make your observation about the the presentation. What did I catch it on? All right, I caught it on a square bill that was, you know, green pumpkin in color. So maybe it's resembling a crayfish. But but once you start saying the why of of making up stories of he, you know, the fish ate it because stop, stop, don't do that. Just get your raw observation set. Just the details. Um, how fast was I moving the crankbait? Mm -hmm. Was it a you know? Was it a subsurface, a medium dive? Was it long? How fast was it going? You basically make observations about the location and your presentation on on every fish you catch. Yeah. It's significant. You know, I don't start building patterns on catching twelve inch, you know, smallmouth. Uh, but you get like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen inch fish. You're you're pretty happy with that and want to, you know make those observations about where it hit and what it hit, how fast it was moving and yeah. how deep and everything else. Then you catch another one and you start looking for common denominators of they're always right next to a, a really strong current scene, or they're always in four foot of water yeah. or they're always near that grass edge or whatever it is that those common, you know, denominators are with these good catches. And then you go, go looking for the example of that location and then you replicate that presentation. Yeah. That's and, pattern development. And, and and I get and, I, I get where that like you said, like there's certain things as soon as you're you're speculating, you know, what that fish might have been eating or something like that. These are all, all those other details are things that you can control and 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 recreate if you can find a similar um detail like you know a, a similar bottom a similar distance from you know a similar current break break something like that yep. if, if you can find that then you can ultimately you could try to recreate that and and you can bypass what isn't that yeah and that's important on tournament day is to know know what you're not going to fish yep that's the point of pre-fishing and that's so much of what um when i filmed the three pre-fishing days with jody queen on candlewood is he was trying to eliminate water yeah. in being able to see so much of a, a big lake like that in seeing it for the first time and really learning, okay, what they, you know, what I, the, the type of bank that he was catching them on. Um, well, it's all in the video, but he, mm -hmm. you know, he covered a lot of water in order to figure out, yeah, this is, this is really where it's going to happen. So yeah, that I mean, that always just it, it, it always Im impresses me. It, it kind of blows my mind when I see an angler that's got a system like that in place where they're just it, they, they almost seem to know exactly where to be. But in reality, like it's just experience, you know, and and with that experience, the ones who really have a command of it are the ones that have, dare I say, a database or a notebook. <laughs> yeah. What, what, one of the things we I harp on for everybody, uh, Jeff, is that since I had my little rebirth into the fishing world, once I, you know, quit drinking, to be quite honest, always comes back to that. I started keeping detailed notes on 
everything from water temperature to weather conditions to lures I caught the fish on. My goal was not at the time competitive fishing. My goal was to spend less on lures. So instead of going to Walmart or Dick's or Bass Pro or Cabela's or any retailer and walking in and be like, ooh, I need 16 colors, I found out and figured out over the course of years what I have success with. And then you can start branching out into, okay, so I'm having success with this lure on this body of water. What in particular, you know, the other D, I can start looking at the other details, which is eliminating water, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And finding those patterns. And I always say on the show, one fish is a fish, two fish is a pattern. You know what I mean? Then you've got something to, to work with. Right. You know? Well, it's it's served me well in in my current lifestyle which is Mm -hmm. living on the road and working with dealers and going to kayak fishing tournaments and interacting with with folks um i i've done this for four years and before this uh i actually have a a degree in nutrition from university of maryland and i worked in healthcare food service for 20 years and i switched from that to to sales which i had never done sales before um but I get to travel a lot. Uh, I've I've sort of mapped out what my what my next month and a half looks like, and mm-hmm. I will be. I mentioned Lake Erie. I'll be there. I'll be north of Chicago, which is where Torquedo is based out of. I have dealers in in Missouri and Arkansas, in between there and Louisiana, and I'm going to go fish a tournament called Ride the Bull, which benefits. Louisiana's Coastal Conservation Association. Uh, we will pre-fish for that. Uh, pre-fish with my uh, one of the team Torquedo anglers, Dustin Nichols, uh, Grand mm-hmm. Isle, Louisiana, catching redfish and nice and speckled trout. And coming back up in early September, I'm meeting with Brett Cummings, who runs Decked Out John Boats, and I'm going to film his rig. He uses a 20 horsepower torpedo on his his uh, his John boat where he fishes the electric only um, reservoirs in North Georgia. Mm-hmm. And then I'm meeting with someone at Jackson Kayak in Tennessee on the way home. And early September, I go up to a fishing lodge in northern Maine with. Uh, with someone from Skiff Canoes, and we're filming something with our travel motor. It keeps going. Yes, yeah, you got I'm a full calendar. I'm, you know, yeah, and I get to fish all these these cool places. Yeah. Um, like a month ago, we were north of north of Boston with uh, with Mike Baker catching, you know, catching forty plus inch striper, like pretty much at will. He's he's a great kayak fishing mm-hmm. guide up there uh, out of Maine in. You know, just swimming the gravity tackle eels, you know, whether it was just under the surface or 25 feet down, whatever. I get to fish all these cool places, but I'm not the expert in in being able to carry the right the right sampling of lures in, in rods that I can apply to a lot of different things mm-hmm. is, is part of it. But the other part is pattern development. Yeah. And... My pattern at the uh, the trifecta, I think I ended, at least for the Kayak Saltwater Series top five, I think I, I had a seventh place finish out of 73 anglers. That's not my, too shabby. My top five was consisted of schoolies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I missed a 42-incher that just that killed me. That was It, it uh, popped off the treble hook right at the you know, boat as I was oh. trying to put the boga grip on. Uh-huh. I think it was about a 42-inch fish. But my pattern that caught the rest of them, you know, I fished from from 6 p.m. the first night all the way till 8.45 a.m. the next morning. Uh, so I stayed out all night because I know the big ones tend to eat well at night. Yeah. It was enough to get a limit pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And uh, but they weren't really dock lights. They were the you know, it was the middle of the night and I was fishing the backs of these big yachts that had those fancy lights that turned from green to blue to red to whatever. Oh yeah. And these, there were minnows in that and you'd see the striper come on up and dive bombing in there. And I just threw a guide to downsize uh, to match the forage base, which they were eating these little, I think rain minnows. And Mm -hmm. I had to throw the smallest jerk bait that I had, uh, which is a saltwater X wrap. I forget what the size is. And I had to let it just sit there. Yeah. Um, 
but it was it was the location and i went from you know lights you know everything in between and i'm only in the boats lights in the water. and you know it was good for i got patient down that in the presentation and sticking it right in the middle of that light and they'd race up underneath it and blast it mm-hmm. you know that's awesome Big, yeah. big ones that, uh, that I was hoping to catch, but it was a it was a limit getter. Nice, that's good. I, I mean, at least at least you got to the limit, you know. Yeah, yeah. That was that was my first time in a kayak on the salt, so I had all the trepidation that you would expect. And uh, luckily enough, um, you know, I had a friend who's very experienced that was was out guiding with us, uh, myself and uh, another <clears throat> um, affiliate, uh, Sarah Pendergrass, came out with us. We she. I'd never been in the salt either. So we were lucky we had, uh, we had Nelson, our, our friend and, you know, cohort here at Jigs and Bigs out leading us around, but he was babysitting. He did take a shot at stripers. We only fished Saturday, but he was gone for half an hour, came up on a school and honestly describing it exactly as you're saying, but in the day, and it sounded like the fish were a lot more sluggish and not even eating as much, but tiny, tiny bait, he said, and they were coming up and sipping it like carp. Yep. Yeah. But, um, it was fun. I had fun. This was a fun tournament for yeah. me. I, I don't know. My ass from a hole in the ground and put uh, salt water, and I didn't die, so that's a win. That's important. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's important. Um, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit, how was it that you discovered fishing? Like, what were, were how did this passion get introduced to you? I don't ever remember not fishing. Oh, all right. And I, I don't remember... There and you know if you if you go back into me being a kid, I don't remember. It wasn't like a father or a grandpa or an uncle or or anyone else mm-hmm. that said, "Hey, kid, I'm going to take you fishing." Um, the, in my memory, there was always fishing, and and how that came to be, I, I you know I'm sure I I have to credit my mother. I know. And what I do remember mm-hmm. of my early fishing is that mom was always dropping me off at this lake or that river or gotcha. whatever, you know, yep. she facilitated, uh, my, my learning and in, in going fishing. I know when I was probably eight or nine years old and it was Easter, uh, well, the Easter bunny didn't leave me like chocolate eggs and jelly beans. Yep. I had top water poppers and little MEP spinners in my Easter basket. That's so awesome. she, she really, you know, in, in a note from the Easter Bunny, here's how you here's how you fish the uh, the Bagley's pop and B three. You know, you, you <laughs> launch it out there into the pond. You wait till all the the ripples in the water disappear, and then you give it three yanks. And and I do that. And I know in the background there's my mom going into the local tackle shop in Rockville, Maryland, asking, "Okay, uh, give me something good for my my kid to fish with." And and how does he you know how does he fish it? And yep. You know, mom facilitated that, and I, I think that's a great model for any parent. Whatever, whatever their help, their help your kid find whatever it is that yeah. they they can't stop thinking about and can't stop begging to go do. And and I have a, I have two sons, and I don't think that my other my older son uh, who's fifteen has figured it out. But my younger one, it's basketball, and we do whatever we can to mm-hmm. keep him playing basketball. Yep. You know, we've. We we live on a farm here in Maryland, and we've we've poured a concrete pad big enough and put a hoop up there, and he's on it constantly. That's uh, awesome. You know, we do we do travel basketball and just to help facilitate the thing that he's passionate about. And I know that he's, you know, someday he'll be. I'll be forty six later this this. Uh, this summer and when he's my age mm-hmm. he'll be in an in a 40 and over league like i just know he's found it and yeah. all we need to do is to help him you know enjoy that sport as much as possible yeah um, foster it as much as he can so that way he's got you know the support system to be able to yep carry him yep that's awesome in, in respect that that's his thing and i think a lot of people that are you know a lot of parents that are passionate about whatever it is yep. i mean he has coaches who have sons that really don't care about you know in the past that don't care about basketball and i do it because dad's like this is it yeah and and i'm thankful for them because basketball is not my game 
No, <laughs> I'm thankful exactly. that there is a mentor out there that is, uh, you know, is willing to work with my kid in the same way I've been able to work through through guiding, but also just people that I meet in taking taking kids fishing. Mm. You know, you don't get to pick what your kid is truly passionate about. They do. Yep. And you just help them help them pursue it and then you know work with who does come at you who who you know what kids and other you know grown up kids come to you that that want to learn the sport even more and just and just teach them just mm-hmm. help them help them enjoy the sport so so what I've is the people that have done that with me for through my whole life so so what is uh what is in your son's easter easter basket a uh, you know a pair of jordans or <laughs> No, it's you know it, it, with 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 my basketball kid, it's it's um, you know it's it's a new net or a weighted basketball or a drill. Or, you know, it's what <laughs> what can help him get better. Yep. Um, but you know, and then there's also what plan one on one with me, which he's he's 13, and and uh, I I think. I think we're at the, he won't admit it, um, but I think we're at the stage where he lets me win every once in a while because <laughs> yep. he, he feels like I will lose interest if I don't win. Yeah. <laughs> like he legitimately, I'm, I'm, you can't see on this, but I'm six foot four. Yep. I'm, I'm kind of a big dude and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm fairly quick, but he's like, Stupid, crazy lightning quick. Yeah, and and, and yes, he he's can, got that he thirteen year old quickness. <laughs> That's oh, awesome, man. man. I love yeah. it. Yeah, I'm interested what you have to say for for this next question. There's one. It's a staple question I ask all my guests. You you're probably familiar with the the question or the the statement that fishing tackle catches more fishermen than the products will actually catch fish. In your opinion, what do you think the the number one like? What's the most ridiculous fishing tackle trend that's been out in your opinion? Uh, and the follow up to that is: Have you been guilty of trying it, and how did it work? Uh yeah, you know that, that's a dangerous question because you're 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 gonna name something really specific that people out there really believe in, oh, and every- you're gonna totally rip into it. Um, this is this is where this is like the most dangerous part of the interview. I'd much you, rather talk I, about things that I that are like that that I believe in. Well, well, well. Let us give Tough you some examples. We'll, we'll let us give you some examples. All right. The usual suspects are the as seen on, as seen on TV lures. Yep. Those get a lot. Um, a lot of people this year have kind of hit the. What was it? The the savage the savage gear suicide duck, the ducks and the, and the, and the spiders. spiders. Those those tend to get most of the. Uh, I just, you're right, it, and and Jeff, it's not to knock any lures because a lot of people name the flying lure, and I am a champion of it. I have used yeah. it around docks, and I will I will go to my deathbed saying the flying lure does work. But you know, I mean, there's some stuff out there that's a little fringe <laughs> i i've had a, a guest say one time the the animal replica lures and and specifically said the 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 spro rat the bbz rat which is on my short list of of go-to wake baits like that's that's one i i just i love it's just a big fish collar but you know what works for some might not work for others like the banjo minnow or something you know you know you never know didn't, didn't somebody say chatterbait one interview yeah yeah, somebody said chat. Somebody said so chat in one interview. Yeah, we're this is a non-binding um, yeah. question. I mean, yeah, you know, um, the Z-Man jackhammer in particular is like is an amazing bait, and I'm I'm not going to knock it. It, yeah. it catches everything in lots of situations, but I see people um, become so married to it that that's all they throw. Yeah, and then and they force it and there are days where where a spinnerbait is going to catch more fish and and when they're just not tuned up to that obnoxious and and jarring a presentation um but that's not answering your question yeah the the one thing i thought of that that people um that people do that that i you know that i did some and i think yeah, that's cool. That's, you know, that, that changes it. And it's in the vein of, 
of of modifying and doing the do it yourself which by the way i, I pro staff for do it molds for mm-hmm. uh, for a bunch of years and i've tackle crafted and i've owned a i was part of uh confidence baits which got coverage in in bassmaster magazine 12 years ago or so and and i love tackle crafting because it allows me to to make something that i can't purchase yeah that really you know, I tie my own hair jigs. I've carved my own plugs. I shoot my own plastic. Uh, I actually had eels that I that I hand poured for this last tournament, and I poured my own jig heads. And you know, I, I like doing all that in in making something that you can't purchase. This product goes along those lines, but it's but it's easy. It's okay. simple. It 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 changes it changes a soft plastic very quickly and anyone can do it and it's spike it spike it spike it it. or any of the dipping the the things where you dip the tail of the the senko or the you know and people really believe oh that little yellow you know makes it look like a bluegill and and because it looks like a bluegill or or it has that yellow on it they're going to eat this creature bait more than if it i just left it green pumpkin I, i i don't believe in it I don't. Okay. I don't think it makes that bit of a that much of a difference. Yeah. Um, I think people get so wrapped up in in is it you know is it green pumpkin or Canada craw or June bug or whatever. And I think generally you have really dark colors, really green colors, um, it, 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 and clear ones and white ones. So mm-hmm. you know, green green or brown, um, black or, or June bug or black blue flake, um, a translucent color or white, Yeah, you know, and, and in simplifying things, like when I order a bunch of, when I stock up on Z-Man, I like using their palmetto bugs and I'll use, you know, I'll get like 10 bags of the black blue, you know, palmetto bugs and I'll get 10 bags of the green pumpkin. Mm-hmm. Um, or if it's, or if it's the, um, you know, if it's the diesel minnow, I will, uh, I'll get some white ones or pearl or whatever it is. And then I'll get, you know, a somewhat translucent, but has flack in it, like the red fish toad, but I don't have like six different colors that are similar in that, you know, okay. Green pumpkin with red flag or, or whatever, you know, um, but yeah, the spike it, I just, you know, I still watch people use it and I'm like, yeah, that's just a mess waiting to happen. And I don't, I don't believe in it. Um, I do believe in scent though. Mm-hmm. Um, I use the liquid mayhem like on everything yep. and it, 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 they get close enough to it and then they, it's just another, another sensory input that makes them believe and they just hold it it's longer so that. Yeah. So that when when they suck in that jig and you didn't really feel it, you didn't feel that classic thump because it's a big fish and they 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 don't have to whack the hell out of it, you yep. know, like a fourteen incher would. Yeah, that big bass, you know, a big large mouth, he can just pick it up. And when he holds it, because it's like oh, it, it even t- tastes right. It's soft and and delicious, and you know, <laughs> and starts moving. You don't get that if it's if it's a you know. If it is a, if it's unscented, yeah. you know, he's going to drop it as, you know, it's as pretty quickly quick. as possible. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's funny. I, I like to use JJ's magic because there's just, it's so strong. It's so strong. Yeah. That garlic scent is so strong. And I think that's exactly what it is, is when, when the fish has it in their mouth, there's something else there that at least kind of like masks the fact that it's an artificial bait. Right, you know, I mean, it's like it's have, honestly, have either of you read uh, the book Knowing Bass? No, no, but I am starting a short collection of uh, of of fishing literature, so I'm gonna I'm gonna write that it's, down. It is a it is a book that was was written by the guy that worked for Berkeley that that came up. I think he came up with the Frenzy series of lures, which is designed to be multi-sensory he's the guy he's the ichthyologist or fish doctor that i think came up with power bait uh he's he's a life i mean his uh it's dr keith a jones 
is his name. Oh, yeah, I see. And it. he no longer works for Berkeley, and the book is out of print. And it's, and it's on Amazon. You're going to try and find a copy, and good luck for finding it for less than $300. On Amazon right now, it's selling for $902.81. Let's yeah. buy two. Let's buy two. We'll use them for a giveaway. <laughs> it's it's a great <laughs> book. You can also find it online, yeah. like an on- online, you know, it's it's out there, but it's it's tremendous uh information especially for the for bass anglers it's uh it gets you thinking uh beyond what your human um sensory or perception or or, Mm -hmm. or thought processes are on on a you know on what's at the end of your line and and how you know what speed you're moving or what sounds it makes and and it, it it helps you it helps you break out of seeing things with human eyes and helps you understand what we do through a fish's perceptive, you know, equipment, if you will. Yeah. Which includes lateral line, the inner ear, the, you know, yes, their sight, you know, they only have three dimension in a little pie wedge out in front of them. And it's, and it's sort of upward and that's why they're so good at, at feeding upward uh, instead of downward, uh, they kind of have a blind spot behind them and, and underneath them. Mm-hmm. Um, they see two dimensional if they look straight out, but the three dimension is you know we humans have eyes on on the same plane on the front of our head, so we see lots of three dimensional. Uh, fish do not see a lot of of three-dimensional they see a little pie wedge of it and you know he has good graphics in there that that explain that and really help you understand why mm-hmm. and fishing it's better to come from downstream up because they're facing upstream yeah. than it is to fish downstream to them um, so knowing bass that's definitely water. worth checking out so uh, Still got you. All right. Yeah, uh, cool. Good. I'm going to go I ahead you again. and move up here. Um, is there a, a, a fishing, you know, specific body of water or destination that's like a dream trip in your mind or like a bucket list trip that you want to take someday? Maybe I'm just at a, and I went through my um, itinerary through like September. Mm-hmm. And I think what I'm most excited about is is filming with Dustin Nichols uh, down at Grand Isle, Louisiana, and catching those shallow water redfish. It's if you haven't done it, if you're a northern based largemouth or smallmouth angler and you've never caught a redfish, you know, go to Louisiana, go to Florida, go even down into the Carolinas. And as you know, get on 95 and run south and do your research and go mm-hmm. catch these these redfish. They're actually migrating or their their range is coming further and further up into the lower Chesapeake. And you know, we we have a reliable lower Chesapeake red red drum fishery now. And I'd say five years ago it, no it really wasn't, you know, it really wasn't a reliable fishery. Um but yeah, Gulf Coast, um, you know, redfish or red drum in in those you know those shallow marsh areas mm-hmm. is so much fun, man. Like, and and it can be stupid simple. Like, you just go down there with a gold spoon, and you can see they're moving from left to right, yep. and you lead them by five or six feet, and you let it flutter down and sit there, and they just crunch it, and you know it's. It's like catching a, you know, a 30 inch largemouth. Yeah. You know, that's crazy. Like sight fishing for a 30 inch largemouth, except I think they're, they're, they're pound for pound, a, a, a stronger pull than, than any of our black bass. No kidding. I, we have a friend of the show who's from that area and fishes pretty routinely in Grand Isle. And, uh, and she just gets on, I mean, the redfish and speckled trout, like they're all over the place and it's. Yep. That's like she's like you got to do it. She's we were talking about trying to hit Louisiana at some point soon, and that was one of the one of the goals. I'm like I, I'd love to get out and go, especially get get out there with a guide who knows the area and just have that experience. 
Right. I'm all about it. No, I think that's a great pick. Um, So the cornerstone of this show really kind of uh, rests on two questions, Jeff. One of them is about a story where you were most proud out on the water, like whatever the, it was. Maybe it was catching like a, a record breaker, like a PB, or maybe it was, you know, a situation that happened that just was kind of crazy. Maybe maybe it had to do with like paddling or whitewater or something like that, but something out on the water that you're most proud of. And then the other one is like that biggest moment that was like the biggest type story where it all just went to shit. I got the first one. I even touched on it earlier in the, in the show. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, river bassin um, tournament on the Susquehanna river in, in 2015. And um, before the end of, you know, we, we ended up with Jed and I combined our, our, you know, my longest three fish it's catch photo release. So it's length based. Yep. Um, my three longest fish and his three longest fish measuring, uh, getting to a total of 123.75 inches. So that's, that's an over 20 inch average. Yeah. And it set a record for the river Bassin series. And that's going up against all the rivers down South people that fish for, you know, big largemouth all throughout the Southern rivers, the, you know, uh, the Flint down in Georgia with the shoal bass, the, the whole Coosa chain, mm-hmm. all of the, you know, the Carolinas based rivers. And, and we did it with, uh, you know, with Pennsylvania smallmouth in, it's awesome. in, we just, we destroyed, you know, like there was no one even close. And the, the conditions that led up to that was, was part of why my buddy Jed and I did so well. Yeah. Um, it had been low and clear and almost drought like conditions most of the summer. And we just hadn't had that much rain. And we had the remnants of one of the tropical storms uh, come up the shore and, and rise that river for the first time in months. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, they just eat, they eat and eat and eat and eat. They eat for days when it's rising, when it has been so low, it's uncovering, it's uncovering areas and forage and food that, that they hadn't had access to uh, in, in a while. It's, it's that much increase in flow is, is, you know, end of September, beginning of October, it's ripping out a lot of the eelgrass, which is leaving all these places, the, you know, the crayfish and the, and the minnows mm-hmm. and the helgramites that, that hide in that, in that cover it leaves them exposed. So everything eats mission. And this was a, this was a tournament that where no motors were allowed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I had to paddle my ass off to hold, hold position, um, really throwing crank baits and spinner baits. And, uh, and everything was basically out of two eddies, one in particular. Uh, and I did get a six pound, 10 ounce small mouth. Um, and you know, it, it's, it was a special day and yeah. I knew that was a special fish. And usually in a tournament, I don't, I don't stop to really document and take a picture of, uh, you know, of something, you know, of a fish, I mean, yeah. other than just on the board. But I, I said, I don't have my tripod or anything else with me, but I'm going to find a way to stack a couple tackle boxes and put my camera on a, on a timer shot. And I took a picture of that that um at 610 and it's i forget either my on facebook my profile pic or my background i forget what it's on, on um i i had that the first night of the um of the tournament like that 42 inch or losing that was it was painful um <laughs> yeah i can imagine i was you know fresh, and that wasn't like a wound. personal best or anything but i'm like i'm competing yeah i need i need that you know that fish on the board to you know to to have a chance of of uh of placing in the kayak saltwater series top five you know striper oh yeah and uh, that was before I got, you know, my my limit of, of schoolies in the dock lights or in the, the yacht lights, as I've, I've talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it was the first fish that I had hit in and it took drag and and I was thinking yeah it's a you know this is a substantial fish but I was trolling a it was a Shimano Colt Sniper 170 so fairly big size jerk bait um, mm-hmm. and it was I don't know I was, it was probably 11:30 close to midnight and I'm tr- I'm I have one deep diver on one side and then that cold sniper on the shallow side and mm-hmm. I'm trolling, straddling the, the uh, channel edge. So on my right, I've got six, you know, between four and six feet of water. Yeah. Uh, in the, in one rod trolling in that. And then I have on my left, I have probably 12 to 15 feet. So I'm on a pretty good channel drop off. Mm-hmm. Um heading out, you know, from the, this river out into the, um, into the sound and, you know, the, the drag starts flying and I, I leave the torpedo on, I keep moving forward to keep pressure. And I grab my, the, the rod that doesn't have the fish on it and I reel it in most of the way. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, he's, he's near the end of his, his run. I need to grab that rod where the fish is on it and start, you know, and start bringing them in. And I bring them in and I get close to these two channel markers. There's one that's a, that's a a, uh, no wake buoy. And then there's one right next to it. That's the, that's the green buoy. And, you know, I get them close and I'm like, God, he keeps taking a run in vaguely in the direction of those. And I don't want him wrapping around the chain for that buoy. And, uh, you know, I, I back, paddle because at that point i still had a line out and i didn't want to use the motor and have the motor gathering the other line that was out there oh yeah uh, so i i pulled the the kill switch the magnet on there so i was i was trying to one hand paddle to pull this fish away from the marker buoy and i'm i click on my headlamp and i look at him i'm like that's a good fish like he's he's next to the boat and it's like that's a great start. And I feel good about it. Mm-hmm. In, uh, uh, and I, I look at my net, I'm like, he's, he's not going to fit in that. If I get my net near the, that one, and I can see that I have one, one of the rear treble in the upper lip. So I barely have him. Oh, I may yeah. have had him more before, but at this point in the fight, there's this big, you know, 11, 12 inch long hard bait and just one treble hook in the upper lip. And, uh, I was like, yeah, if I get the net anywhere near him, that net is going to grab those front trebles and just rip it out. Yep. And uh, I'm like, I got I to gotta get the bogo on there, but I also don't want to just reach down and, and lip him. Um, I remember talking with Corey, who won it. He got the, 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 uh, the you know, he won first place in the kayak saltwater series top five. And he he was fishing a topwater bait, and he just did that. He reached down and grabbed it. He had a treble hook go right through the meat of his his uh, his hand of his thumb. He showed me a picture oh, no. in that tournament, and that's what he, I was trying to avoid. He showed everybody and, that picture. Uh, it was vile. <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty brutal. Um, but he kept going, and and he won. It's, it's just you know he's. He's a amazing angler. Anyways, um, so I'm like, I gotta get my boga grip out and get this on the bottom lip, and I'm and I'm reaching down to to pull it out, and I have the the boga open, and I'm going towards him, and there's just one last little head shake, and it pop, and it goes off, and no. I and I could see the you know the, the hard bait pop out of the water and spring up towards me towards the front of the boat, and I'm like, okay, it, and in that moment, I, I would say. 10, 15 years ago, I would have had a meltdown. And I've gotten to the point now, though, where I look at that and I acknowledge that sucks. However, this tells me I'm doing something right. I am doing what I need to do. I've I've gained some knowledge. There's some information of, of how I am able to get a big fish to eat. And, uh, and I should feel good of that, about that, that, you know, I've, I'm doing something right mm-hmm. and I can do it again right now if I pull my stuff together and do it in, in that difference in, in, you know, 
whether you're going to yield to the meltdown, that emotional like spiral of uh, just the bad thing just happened, or whether you say, yep, that sucks. Um, however, yep. there's a there's a silver lining that I'm doing the right things to get the bites. And, and I think I really chronicled that well. That that concept because that's a, that's something that divides the really great anglers from the ones that are that are pretty good. Um, I chronicled that really well with my day one and day two of filming Jody Queen on Candlewood. Oh, okay. Jody Jody did really for his standards poorly on day one of the tournament or, mm-hmm. or the Candlewood. I think he he got he had been getting upper nineties total the whole. You know, in three days of fishing, he he didn't have a day where he was under 95 inches in pre-fishing, smashing them. And on day the first day of Candlewood, he ended with a 79-inch total. To to pull out of that and come back on day two mm. and and be leading and get a second is is why he is a professional. This is why he's a full-time kayak fishing tournament angler it's it is his 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 primary source of income because he has the maturity as an angler to not let a poor performance on day one affect his day two yeah and and he left with a good check because he had to it's his job and and when you relinquish the you know when you give yourself permission to have that meltdown, that, that spin out, that whatever, to indulge in, in your emotions, you know, uh, you've lost there in that moment. But if you can have the control to say, Hey, I may have lost that fish, but I at least know something I need to do again to get the next big fish. Yeah. Um, that didn't work out real good for me for the rest of that tournament because that was the only big that I had on, but I but I kept at it. Like that happened at you know almost midnight, and I was still out there another nine hours. Yeah, it didn't shake um, it. And then again the next day, yep. you know. So that's awesome. Yeah, that was a wah wah wah, but but it didn't stop me. No, you know? exactly, and, and that's what's. That's a good takeaway. And you're right. You you can't like you know like you get it out of your system, shake it off, and then you just got to keep keep going. You know, right. <clears throat> it's the same thing. Someone had recently asked me. They said, um, you know, like when when you go out and you you go out day after day and you're just on a streak of just skunk. You're not catching any fish. You're just like, what the hell's happening? You know, somebody had had put it out. I think it was actually Wild Bill from Hookshead Hoodlums had said all it means is that the next time you go out, that's your moment. Like the next time you go out and, you know, you can't just throw the towel in. Like you got to go out that that next time or take that next cast or what it is. That could be when, you know, you hook into a giant. So, and so I had that back in, in March and I was, I was competing in my home striper water of the upper Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. And I kept a, I kept a journal of each of my trips and in the distances I went and I didn't really, you know, long story short, I turned it into a, um, an article that I, that I've given to NRS, which, uh, makes, mm-hmm. makes the dry suits and the life jackets and all the clothing that I wear. And, and they make some inflatable boats that I use there, whatever NRS, uh, it was, it was, you know, I, I submitted it to, to them for their they call it their duct tape diaries mm-hmm. but it was and they haven't published it yet i guess they're they're sitting on it till it's relevant again next spring but what it was it was a a trip log of the entire month of of march and my competing in the kayak saltwater series and it's in i think it was like 14 individual trips where some of them was a, hey, I'm, I'm launching. I had stuff to do during the day, and I'm launching at, mm-hmm. at uh, 4 p.m., and I'll stay out until 10 o'clock at night. And yeah. some of them were, hey, I'm getting up at, at you know, mm-hmm. at 3 a.m., and it's an hour drive, and I'll fish from 4 a.m. until midnight the next night and, and just do this epic, huge, long trip. Mm-hmm. But I kept track of the number of miles, and I think I was – like 240 some miles that I covered in the month of, of March on the Chesapeake Bay. And the majority of those, those 14 trips were skunk trips. 
Oh, and yeah. the point you know, where it's relative is that, you know, I, you know, it's always fun to catch that first wave of bigs rolling in. Sure. And in order to do that, in order to not be the guy that's listening to the story of, oh, man, you should have been here a week ago. They rolled through and it was just like every every cast was a 35 plus inch fish, you know. Mm-hmm in order to be the guy that's telling that story, as opposed to the one that's hearing the story, you have to endure those skunk trips yeah. with a migratory species like that. Yep. And, you know, I think I chronicled it well. And, and, you know, it's, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of distance covered in, and you have to have that mental resolve to, to keep going. And, you know, third, mm-hmm middle of the third week of March, um, I was, you know, I was smashing 42 inches one after the other. Yeah. And I had found them in a place that I really didn't think was going to, it, it was, you know, it was very deep into the plans of places I was going to, going to hit. Like it wasn't, you know, a place that I'd done well in years past mm-hmm. and, uh, but it paid out and it, it's, I ended up winning that monthly challenge for the kayak saltwater series. Um, I won March, but if you had only read, you know, the first half of that, that article, you know, it's like, what's wrong with this guy? He just went five trips in a row catching nothing. Yeah. You know, um, you know, you're, you're still learning something. And, uh, you know, I think the, the big lesson there is that, you know, it, it you have to keep trying new water Definitely. and keep exploring yep. if it's not happening in places you know seasonally where it has in the past you you got to you got to go places that you're unfamiliar with and you'll find fish um you know when they arrive so. Definitely Awesome. Well, Jeff, this was awesome, man. Do me a favor. Take this moment here. Go ahead. Let people know where they can connect with you on social media, where they can check out some of your content. And uh, go ahead, promote yourself. If you have anything coming up or, or anything you want someone to take a look at, this is a great opportunity. Go ahead and go for it. You know, I think first and, and foremost, I'm a, a sales manager for Torquedo Electric Outboards, and they... Um, you know, I sell them from the one and three horsepower um, ultralights that go on kayaks all the way up to 20 horsepowers that go for the electric only, you know, reservoir rigs. Um, the the two Facebook pages that I manage uh, related to those are Torquedo Kayak Fishing for the ultralight and then Torquedo Fishing and Hunting for the for the bigger motors. Um a lot of the filming that I mentioned that I'm doing uh, with Brett Cummings of Decked Out John Boats, with Dustin Nichols, who's a team torpedo angler down in Louisiana, and Chuck Earls up on Lake Erie. I'm producing videos to go on those two pages to promote the product. Um, but everything that I produce, all the videos I produce go on my YouTube channel called The Little Stuff. And because it is it's a little stuff that makes a difference, whether you're, uh, you know, whether you're you're just out there fishing or you're actually catching mm-hmm. uh, the little details like using scent <laughs> or whatever. It's it's the details, but it's also my last name, Jeff Little, and is the little stuff that makes the difference um, on Instagram. It's Jeff Little Kayak Fishing. Um, and I, I think that's about it. Cool. Uh, you know, you can find me on Facebook as well. So that's awesome, Jeff. We appreciate it, man. You've got a wealth of knowledge. And uh, to our listeners, you guys should definitely go and take a look at that YouTube channel. It's very, very interesting stuff. I would say uh, start with the, uh, I think it's the second video, if you look down on the uh, on his list of videos. The one having to do with fizzing is super interesting. Check that one out. That's the one Sean told me to start with. I'm glad that I did. That's the one Jeff told me to start with because yeah. as we started talking, I had told him I just had my first opportunity to fizz a fish with that that massive pike I caught in Minnesota, and that led into this whole thing. Um, Jeff, thanks a lot for for being with us, man. And uh, I think we talked as we were leaving the trifecta, and uh, at least myself, maybe Bobby Rose Beef, will see you at the national championship for KBF in September uh, in October. Excuse me. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll see you down there. Awesome, thanks. man. 
Thank Thanks, you, guys. Thank you. Have a great one. Well, that's about going to do it for your old boy here, Bobby Rose Beef and Sean the Fisherman. It's been a good episode here, Jigs and Bigs. Uh, it was really good. It was great having Jeff Little on the show. Jeff is uh, very, very talented. Check out his YouTube channel for sure. Uh, the little, the, what is it? The little stuff. Little Ch- stuff. Yeah, little stuff. Check out his YouTube channel. Lots of really cool information there. And I'm going to tip you guys off to the the video that I think you should start with that I think is really great. Look at the one about fizzing. Uh, that's one Sean had recommended to me, and it's just it's really just just very, very interesting, interesting, interesting stuff. Essentially, what he does is he kind of follows around um other people on the water and sort of like documents some techniques and, and different different things that, that they have going on. So check it out. You're really, really, really gonna like that. Um as far as uh as as Jeff goes, make sure to check out Torquedo if you're looking to add power to your kayak uh with uh a motor, Torquedo makes a bunch of different models that are all designed to fit various different hulls. And uh, yep. they're very, very popular. Check it out. Like, Torquedo has has killer, killer products. You can get your Torquedo products from our good friends over at Three Bells Outfitters. If you have any questions, you can contact them, or you can contact Jeff as well, and he'll be glad to answer some of your uh, your questions about uh, motorizing your, uh, your yak. All sorts of boats too, not just kayaks. John boats. Uh, did I think Canoes? they had a couple bass boat models too, right? Oh wait, I got their fucking. I believe there's a canoe model hey, as well. Whoa, if you're whoa. part of the lifestyle. Look what I grabbed. Look how smart I was. Oh, the smartest of all raccoons. Just a just a yeah, smartest raccoon I know. Just to uh, just to, to educate myself on on Torquedo's products, uh, I grabbed their product guide. Their oh. handy dandy product. They got all sorts of shit in here. This wasn't like Jeff's only one. You weren't like, ha it's mine now. I, I can't guarantee that. Okay. But <laughs> fair. <laughs> I mean, we got kayak models. We got, well, there's a lot of kayak models, obviously. We got one on a, <clears throat> well, looks, it looks to be on a schooner right here. Look at this, Bobby Rose a Beef. Schooner. It's oh. not a sailboat. It's a that. schooner. It's a schooner. Sailboat is a schooner, idiot. So, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's the giant inflatable rafts. This guy's got one on his John boat. Holy shit, this guy's got one on his own. You ever seen those mini pontoons? They're not like full yes. pontoons. Yep. They're like the H2 when that came out. Remember the H2 yep. was like a mini Hummer. It was real cute. Yeah, same thing. No, the torquedo has got some a shit, A mini man. pontoon for when you only have a few friends. Or, or none. Or none. Or, or none. Yeah. If you're rich enough. What do they got? They got fucking... Wow, they got everything. If you're a real piece of shit. While you're perusing <laughs> through that, I do want to jump in here. Lockwood jumps in and says, Bobby, you and Swamp Ass going to come visit uh, fish while you're in AC? Uh, we're actually, that whole trip to AC is on hold right now. I'm not even sure that we'll be attending that show. So I, I we're going to see what happens this week and kind of play it by ear. We'll figure it all out. <laughs> um. Lockwood jumps in again and also says that Ike uses Torquedo. Yes, he does. Yeah, he does. Is that a pic of Ken and Andrew? Yes, on their yacht. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh goodness. So, this yeah. It was def- definitely a takeover episode. It really was. <laughs> it was. I'm okay with that, though. I am. I'm 100% okay with that. Uh, anyway, we, we do want to, again, once again, the, uh, the, the fishing report, the Western Massachusetts fishing report is out there for you guys to check out. Uh, Cheryl Northeast wild woman has been killing it. Absolutely. Um, we've got, of course you did Lockwood. Of course you blew up a pontoon boat. There is, uh, all kinds of great information there week to week to week. We generally have it posted for you guys on Thursdays. Check that out. Um, also, we have uh, stickers available at our store, uh, our, our merch store on jigsandbigs.com. You can go ahead and uh, and and check out stickers there if you if you need stickers, they're available. Uh, but we're also including them with any purchases over like twenty five bucks. So you can go ahead and uh, and get your stickers if you need them. Um, and of course, you know, as always, we're just gonna have a good one. Oh my god. <laughs> Lockwood chimes in and goes, I'm going to call three bells and drop Joe Brown's name. <laughs> you, I, I bet you won't do it. <laughs> I bet you won't. <laughs> As for Lauren, you'll wince. <laughs> true. You will know pain. <laughs> oh, goodness. 
All righty, guys, that about does it for this episode. I, I feel really good about it. I think this is a good week. It's really nice to be back doing these on these private live streams for our jig heads. If you would like to be a jig head and you would like to get in on these early sort of recording sessions where you can chime in and, and be sort of part of the show, it's easy. All you have to do is go to jigsandbigs.com. There's a button right on our landing page. It says become a patron. This is all through our Patreon page. Uh, all you got to do is go and subscribe over there. It's a $5 a month contribution, which goes directly to help keep the show up and running. Uh, all that stuff is all, all basically what, what keeps, uh, you know, the, the, the little fees that we have for promotions and, and, and all that and hosting and all this other stuff that goes on. So everything that we do, uh, is all kind of like gets rolled back right into the show. So we appreciate you guys very, very much. Hey, have yourselves a great week, everybody get out there and get on some fish. Um, we've got a whole bunch of new guests that will be coming up very, very soon. As we get into the fall, there seems to be this trend where we get a whole lot more bookings for, for different guests of all different types. So I'm really excited with what we have for you going into the winter. Lots of big news coming up. Plus we are working on some jigs and bigs live live events. That's one of the things. So if you dig that, you're definitely going to want to come check out the after party, uh, the meet and greet over at over at Old Glory Outdoors. Uh, we will be there along with a bunch of the Hookset Hoodlums Pro staff, as well as, you know, I mean, just just all of us will be there having a great time, talking a lot of smack, and some of us are eating some bull nuts, guys. Have your... What, what's that? We're going to have the crowd from Happy Gilmore there. <laughs> Pretty much. Joe's going to come in. There's two bikers banging in the woods. <laughs> and one last thing, Bobby, I wanted to throw out there. Fire away. For the FTG segment for Fuck That Guy, if you have a Fuck That Guy story, yeah. please go to our website. Click on a button to leave us a message. You've got 60 seconds. Have at it. Yeah. You know what? Practice what you're going to say beforehand because... Andy has set the bar mighty high because that was a good FTG today. Even if you don't have a submission for FTG, if you just want to leave us a message there for whatever reason, odds are we're going to use it on the show. So whether it's an FTG or you have some info for just the tip, go ahead, jump in there. If you have anything that you would like to contribute as part of the show, we'd love to have you have your voice to be able to utilize to pop this on here. Even if you want to go ahead and tell us to fuck off, I don't care. It's cool. <laughs> We don't get that enough. Like what? what the fuck? We get it We're from going delirious. All night. We get if, if del- all- like I, I, we get it from delirious all the time. Every morning, in fact, in that in the group chat. Morning, fuckers. We, fuck we've you. been getting it this whole recording in the comment section on fucking live stream it's here. True. It's true. Uh, sure. Tell one more person can't hurt. I guess right. Yeah, it's good. It thickens <laughs> the skin up. And after the session I had with the burn, dude, the tops of my arms, I I burn so bad right over my my big tattoo. Uh, not good. Thanks. Not good. I'll, I'll tell you what. What's that? Remember how I mentioned that I started the the fucking acupuncture and shit and they yeah. put the, the hot fucking um, cups on? The hot mops it's and really, shit? They're up the there with the hot mops. mops? Yeah. So uh, my acupuncturist no. decided to go after a couple areas that she hadn't really hit yet. My entire back blistered up. That's good because like, like, I'm that moving around. Look at me. Yeah, Look yeah, me. yeah. I'm You're dancing. Limber. Fucking, I'm like a marionette. I'm all loosey-goosey. But... My back looks like someone fucking tried to try to iron a shirt while I was wearing it. Yeah, it's not fun. So, yeah, it's not good. That's but, not uh, fun. Anyway, guys, have yourself a great week. I know, Brett. I know. Bad move. Suggestion's going to open up doors that won't be able to shut. It's okay. I like that kind of. I like a little bit of abuse. I like it a little rough. Have you ever met my wife? Anyway, guys. Like the pickerel now and again. <laughs> just, <laughs> just take a big old pickerel and slather it all over the burn. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, that's that. not what I was I thinking, but that, that. too. <laughs> and, and then a little coconut stop. oil. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All righty, guys. Have yourselves a great one, everybody. I appreciate <laughs> you so much. Uh, get out there and catch some fish. If you're not entered in the current Jigs and Bigs tournament, join in now. Get in this last week. If you get on like just a, a, a string for this week, you can win this sucker. All it takes is one good day. That's it. One good day could do it. And uh, like we said, Chronic Trips is happening in August. And then in September, Jigs and Bigs once again. And Jigs and Bigs is going to Champlain. And that's going to be some good stuff. Get ready for some footballs. That's all I'm saying. God, I hope we catch some footballs. I'm on it. You're bringing me. Yeah, I hope we catch some (laughs) footballs. Hey, my dad went out yesterday with his uh, new combo. 
And yeah, we went out to Chicopee Reservoir. I got to check in with him, see how he did. But he's like, yeah, I'm psyched. He's like, I'm gonna, you know, try and catch some trout, maybe see if there's some bass that'll bite on this little netty thing you, you set up. I'm like, yeah, well, I'll probably get on with a little net rig. It can happen. It can definitely happen. Sure can. Yeah. Sweet, man. Nice. Guys, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for everything. You're the absolute best listeners. Any podcast in the world could be lucky to have. Uh, you know, if uh, we don't see you beforehand, tight lines.